One moment, please. Okay. Hello, thank you for joining us tonight. I call this meeting order at 6.09 p.m. The board met and closed session and the following action was taken. Public employee appointment employment. The board approved the appointment of the following administrators. Jennifer Eklund, principal, Arlene Hine Elementary School. Natasha Lewis Jones, principal, Samuel Jackman Middle School. Richard Gutierrez, Director, Secondary Education. Again, good evening and welcome to the Elk Grove Unified School District's virtual board meeting through the Zoom webinar platform. We thank you for joining us and ask for your patience in advance as we navigate this platform for conducting school board meetings. Legislative bodies, including school districts, have been permitted to hold board meetings telephonically or by other electronic means because on March 17, 2020, the governor issued Executive Order N2920 suspending certain provisions of the California Ralph and Brown Act. On June 11, 2021, the governor issued Executive Order N0821 extending the suspension of certain provisions of the California Ralph and Brown Act through September 30, 2021. Consistent with N0821, this board meeting is being conducted via the Zoom webinar platform, specifically a school board that holds a meeting via teleconferencing and allows members of the public to observe and address the meeting telephonically or otherwise electronically, consistent with the notice and accessibility requirements shall have satisfied any requirement that the body allow members of the public to attend the meeting and offer public comment. Such a body need not make available any physical location from which members of the public may observe the meeting and offer comment. Zoom public comments for those indicating in advance of this meeting through the Google platform that they would like to speak during comment using the Zoom platform, your name will be called upon during the appropriate section of the meeting. At that time, your microphone will be unmuted. On your screen at home, there will be a message asking you to unmute. Once you click or tap to unmute, your microphone will be live and you will then be able to give your public comment. When your time is complete or you have finished, your microphone will be muted by the district. You must have the most recent version of the Zoom platform to make live public comment. If you do not have the latest version, you will not be able to make your live comment. During your comments through the Zoom webinar platform, a timer will be available on the screen. And at the end of your time, your microphone will be muted. The district believes in an inclusive, welcoming and safe environment for its meetings for all of our community. Public comments provide an opportunity for members of the public to address the Board of Education in an open meeting. The board will not take action or discussion on any item not appearing on the posted agenda, except as authorized by law. The board respects each individual's rights to express ideas and opinions pursuant to applicable law and board policy. The board will not prohibit public criticism of the board or the district. It is an ongoing objective of the district to serve all of our students and to prepare them to flourish as responsible, ethical, and productive citizens. In preserving this mission, we kindly ask that when making public comment, you refrain from the use of profanity exercise tolerance of others and their viewpoints and exemplify model behavior. Please be mindful students are watching. You are encouraged to address the board and the public in a respectful manner such that all those observing from children to adults are made to feel welcome, safe and valued. The board will not permit any disturbance or willful interruption of board meetings. Persistent or excessive disruption by any individual or group shall be grounds for the board president to terminate the privilege of addressing the board. We appreciate the public's participation and your assistance in helping the board keep its meetings efficient, effective, and respectful. All written electronic public comments that were submitted will be provided to the Board of Education in writing. Today's meeting is being video recorded and will be available on the district's YouTube channel. We always start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And since I have neglected to ask someone ahead of time, I'm going to ask Mr. Oh, are you volunteering again? Yeah. Mr. Perez has volunteered again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Well, well, the first thing on our agenda is public comment. Ms. Soriano, are there any public comments for items not on the agenda? 
Yes, Madam Board President Albiani, there are items uh, for public comment, not on the agenda. There are approximately 12 written and four Zoom. Thank you. Uh, for the Zoom calls, in order would be Emelina Mendoza, Alice Yan, Jessica Chen, and Heidi Moore. Hello, may I speak? We can hear you, thank you. Yes, my name is Amelina Mendoza and I thank the opportunity to address the board today. And my concern is regarding the return to class in the fall. I have two children in high school that are enrolled in the Elk Grove um, Unified School uh, District who are looking forward to in-person classes and most of all, to see their friends and to make memories together in this academic year. As you see, last year, all this was robbed from them. And as you may know, and I know, that mask wearing is not a law, therefore it cannot be enforced. Some may reply, it's uh, our policy. Our policies cannot break established laws. And speaking of laws, California Penal Code 185 prohibits uh, mask wearing in public. It's ironic how uh, for this whole year, more than a year, we've been told to break the law and to wear a mask as a condition to you know, attend school or any activity in school, parents, students, and teacher, teachers alike. Now, my question is, how are you planning to enforce the mask wearing as middle school and high school students return to class? What about those with medical condition or even religious belief? What would the consequences be for those um, who refuses to wear a mask simply because they choose to breathe freely? Are they going to be sent to the principal's office? What, um, what if half of the school refused to wear a mask? Is the office big enough for all of them? If that's gonna be one of the consequences? I think the board needs to be courageous and exercise its authority confidently by trusting science as a guide check the true data for yourselves and use common sense to make a rational decision. We all know that some tasks required PPE as that task is being developed, but wearing a mask for a long period of time is unnatural. The experts have warned us of the negative impact on children as it hints their developmental stages. They will suffer emotional distress when you finally tell them to remove the masks after, being, after wearing it for so long. Also, their ability to create things, have ideas and share them, their need for social interaction are greatly affected, let alone isolation, anxiety and distress due to the fact that they will believe that they are not safe without the mask. These facts cannot be ignored as you as a board make decisions that affect our children. If there is any attitude demanding mask in schools motivated by believing it is a salvation for this virus, I invite you to move beyond that. You see, I think school should be a place that inspires students to learn, an environment that form great citizens for society and a place where students look forward to be at. I think we all can Our next speaker. Next speaker is Alice Yan. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm a mom of a ninth grade student from Elk Grove. So um, there are a lot of parents joining this meeting tonight has the same concern about the COVID spreading faster and more new cases has been confirmed. So that's why we are highly request to have an option of distant learning. So students who prefer attending person class, they still can. For thousands of students who prefer to choose online class, they should have this option as same as last semester. This is the best way can help reduce crowding in classroom and also can help reduce the risk to expose under the virus. We understand that there are options to choose the virtual academy and independent study. 
but students will have to face more changes, such as school teachers and classmates' study styles that they already used to. And also, lots of parents concerned if the pandemic situation getting better, they might not able to enroll back to the same school due to it's a full. And even everyone wear a mask in the classroom, children still can control themselves to never touch their eyes or ears in the school by hands. So viruses are able to stick on hands, tables, door handles, and toilet, even faucet. So there are still a lot of risk and concern. And also from July 11th to July 17th, 1,184 new cases confirmed in Sacramento County with a 32.88% increase. And more so, as everybody knows that the Delta variant is more contagious than previous strains. So, so, and also the Delta Plus variant has a mutation that allows the virus to better attack lung cells and potentially escape the vaccines. And also, as we know that a lot of the children, they still have a, they still did not get vaccine yet. So that's why we are very, very concerned about to go back to school. So we hope that this chair can highly consider our request. Thank you so much. Jessica Chen. Ms. Chen? She using a different screen name, Mr. Mate. Hello? There we go. We can hear you, thank you. Hello? Hello, we can hear you, thank you, Ms. Chen. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go oh, ahead. Hello, uh, this is Jessica. Um, I have two children, so they are under 12 years old. So as a result of the recent case and the new virus of the virus, um, we hope uh, our children can continue the distance learning, especially for the children under 12. And um, if we choose the uh, virtual academy, we hope uh, they can keep the space in the current school and yeah and we want to discuss some some ways to lower the risk from the infection for the children yeah that's what my concern thank you and heidi moore hello Hi, Ms. Moore, we can hear you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I am coming before you to plead to consider that you consider making wearing a mask a choice for all children within the district. Gavin Newsom's most recent guidance says that districts are able to choose for themselves their own mask policy. That means you can choose to let our kids have mask choice and for parents to decide what is best for their own children. The district is claiming to follow CDC guidance, but that's all it is, guidance, not rules or laws. So it is actually absurd that you are requiring masks at our schools, especially when children are the lowest spreaders of COVID-19 and the least affected by the virus. I have four children in the district. My youngest is only seven years old. My biggest concern comes from a study published by the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatric Section. The study found that children wearing a mask that covers their nose and mouth had an increase in carbon dioxide levels in both inhaled and exhaled air. The study tested 45 children between the ages of 6 and 17. After only three minutes, 
the children's carbon dioxide levels were tested separately for inhaled and exhaled air and found to be up to six times the level that is acceptable for an adult. A seven-year-old in the study was tested to find 25,000 parts per million carbon dioxide levels after only three minutes. And for a reference, adults in the workplace, it is only acceptable to have up to 10,000 parts per million carbon dioxide in an eight hour period. So we're exposing our children to unsafe levels of carbon dioxide levels. Please do not claim that you are trying to keep children healthy and safe. I call that a lie or maybe ignorance, but please educate yourselves about the many negative effects of children wearing masks. I've only mentioned one, but another study also tested clean masks and they were positive for several kinds of bacteria, including staph. That was clean masks. Please stop this requirement. In my opinion, it is abuse to make children wear a mask. Please make it a choice for children and their families. Other districts are allowing mask choice. This is not something that you have to do. Now is the time to step up and do what is right for our kids. Please, you've proven to not put our children first for the last 18 months. They deserve that you look at the science and the facts and do what is right for them, please. Thank you. Now we'll move to written comment. Yes, thank you. comments are next. Um, the first comment comes from Mark Graham. Good afternoon, school board members. I request a written response from the board. The school district uses a lot of internet. Some cities like Chattanooga, Tennessee have built city owned community broadband networks. The one in Chattanooga has been up and running since 2012. A city owned community broadband network provides many benefits. Students would have fast internet service at home, 100 megabytes to one gigabyte per second up and down. Schools would have fast internet service. Both families in the district would save a lot of money and it would free families and district from reliance on big corporations who can raise prices at any time. Board members, please watch this short uh, one and a half minute video on community broadband networks from the Institute of Local Self-Reliance. I'm providing the link in this comment. The city of Elk Grove has received about 22 million from the federal government through the American Recovery Plan Act. The city did a survey seeing, seeking residents input on how to spend that money. This will be an ongoing process. At the July 28th, the city um, at the July 28th meeting, the city council will receive a report and summary of that survey from the staff. This would be an excellent opportunity for the school district to comment right away, so that the city has long has it long before July 28th on the possibility of a city-owned community broadband network and how the district and students would benefit from it. District staff should meet with city staff to discuss how a city-owned community broadband network might be built and how it would be started possibly a feasibility study by the city, which would solicit input from the district and local residents and businesses. But the district need not wait for such a feasibility study. The district should recommend that the city do it. This is also a great opportunity for the board to reevaluate its policy of using Wi-Fi in the classroom. According to my calculations, there are about 14,000 hours of classroom learning in grades K through 12. That is about 14,000 hours of exposure to hazardous electromagnetic radiation for each student and teacher from about 30 student computers plus the commercial Wi-Fi router on the ceiling. Long-term exposure to such radiation causes learning and memory deficits, DNA damage, headaches, structural and func functional changes to the reproductive system and cancer. See www.emfscientist.org in the National Toxicology Program study from November 2018 uh, and in July 2016, I recommend that the district hardwire all of its students' computers, thereby eliminating all of that unnecessary radiation exposure. I recommend it again. You could do it for a few million dollars. Please place the health and safety of your students and teachers first. Sincerely, Mark Graham, Keep Cell Tennis Away. The next comment comes from Moises Aguilar. 
Superintendent Hoffman and esteemed members of the board, EGSD has failed to communicate its reasoning on bringing all employees back physically or how that it is in its best interest. With the continued rise of COVID cases across our state and county, it is becoming increasingly difficult to accept that bringing all employees back is truly in the best interest of EGSD without a clear message being conveyed. We are left to question this claim. Employees whose essential functions can be completed offsite with no hardship to the district are being asked to come in with no clear explanation of how this benefits Elk Grove Unified School District. Bringing in employees whose essential functions could be completed offsite without any hardship to the district places all employees at necessary risk, at unnecessary risk. Elk Grove Unified School District is needlessly increasing the number of employees at sites at a time when COVID cases continue to rise. I applaud all staff who show up on site with essential functions that require them to be present physically. Schools in the district could not operate without you. It is a disservice to you that the district is needlessly increasing the number of employee presence at sites. I urge the board to decrease staff at sites by allowing modifications to work locations where those modifications would have no impact on essential function or hardship to the district. Thank you. The next comment is from Adia Obolu. Uh, this is regarding BYLP in Elk Grove Unified. BYLP can help support Black student achievement. EGUSD is failing on giving Black students the resources they need to thrive. BYLP could give students not only support, but a community and a sense of belonging and safety in and outside of school. The next comment is from Emily Outenreit. Gen up, Gen up has courageously and completely led an effort to get a student seat on the school board. This needs to be taken seriously and I support the seat being added. In addition, Gen up's student bill of rights was not handled in a timely manner and should be prioritized by the equity office. This next comment is from Ms. Lorene Pryor. Well, I wish I were surprised by the reluctance to put additional help in place to support black students who have constantly been underserved in this district. I am not. For three and a half years, I have watched this district and their staff put roadblock after roadblock in place. I have remained steadfast in good faith because our children deserve to be seen and treated as human beings. June 22nd, I sat at the boardroom while this board leadership made the community wait as they allowed their staff to present parts of BYLP's proposal as their own. I watched as the cobbled together presentation was applauded as if it was revolutionary. Frustrated does not even begin to express my feelings. Your staff runs this district and has you in the number one spot for disproportionate discipline of black children. Then to continue to pile on incidents, you have district staff riding in district vehicles with Confederate flags and folks engaging me on Facebook saying they are supplemental staff who believe five or more black students in a class diminishes the quality of education. Shame on it all. As always, BYLP isn't going anywhere. Partnership or not, we will be holding this district accountable. Count on it. We are not for sale and will not be quiet. The next comment comes from Ginny Smith. My name is Ginny Smith. I am a member of BYLP, co-host on podcast Black versus the Board of Education and member of Black Girls Support Network. I'm a Black female who has been through EGUSD and am now a 10th grader at Foreign High School. Succeeding in EGUSD as a Black student has been like running marathon with weights on my ankles. The more I advance through grades, the greater the weight is. You all treat us like you're taming monsters. The way I've watched administrators, staff, and even counselors to handle black kids. The tone change when we are addressed, the lack of attention given to our problems. It really breaks my heart to see that you all try to ignore the comments of us students and how persistent we must be to get our problems addressed. The disproportionate disciplinary rates of your district is diminishing. Your teachers don't know how to handle Black males, your counselors lack connection to Black females, and honestly, there are barely any Black staff on your campuses. I honestly feel like, as the board of my district, you all play a part in the school-to-prison pipeline system because you all help in denying us Black children of the resources we need. There is no reason why there shouldn't be a BYLP in every school in your district. 
If you talk to any student who is a member of BYLP, you would hear the contribution that was made in benefiting their well being. You guys need a BYLP on every campus. The next comment is from Leah Delgado. Um, I believe it's actually for consent agenda, but I'm not sure. It's a question about what is the funding for race and educational equity. Uh, the next comment is from Melissa Sutton. Virtual learning was a safe space for students, especially the black community. We weren't subject to the microaggressions and the negative tone changes that teachers had specifically for black students during this time at home. We felt as if it were treated almost as equals when doing at home learning, but fear arises when thinking about being about in-person learning because black students don't wanna go back to how it was before. The path didn't work and it will continue to not work. We don't want to feel smaller and not like people when back in person due to the way teachers talk to us. Just because we are black doesn't mean that we shouldn't reach for the accelerated classes. It doesn't mean that when we are asked questions, we're doing it to be annoying. And it doesn't mean that we don't have feelings and the way you talk to us doesn't affect us. It is teachers and administrators job to treat us just at, like they do all of the other students in our classrooms. That is the bare minimum, and it's what we expect and deserve. The next comment is from Jada Prayer. It has been made known that the superintendent has decided to release a request for information from the community organizations that have submitted proposals, which includes BYLP. I'm very concerned with your willingness and ability to protect black children in your school district. BYLP has consistently demonstrated its capability to build intentional healthy relationships with black families in this community. Black students in your district have expressed their wants for BYLP's presence on your campuses and it, and that is because we have made we have been successful in providing safe spaces for black youth. Why are we really prolonging the partnership with the EUSD and BYLP? Is there a hidden agenda that will not be in favor of black children and their health and wellness? As a community member, I am trying to understand why, it, why is it that when black students need support and services, it cannot be delivered as quickly as anyone else's services. Black children in your district need this partnership. What will be done to ensure it is going to happen? The next comment comes from Exquisitive Hundley. Good evening, my name is Exquisitive Hundley. I'm here today to remind you that while El Grove Unified School District remains number one in the state of California for disproportionate discipline of black students, they were given a proposal by WeWLP to help mitigate this, this very issue, but want to prolong the process and want to further traumatize our black babies. I noticed your recent attempt at equity and trying to put a plan in place to address the issues plaguing our black students, and it's duly noted, However, what is quite confusing that needs to be cleared up for the community is at the last board meeting, it was presented as though the targeted equity programs for our black students were ready to be implemented immediately. But according to your district website, you currently have three positions that need to be filled within the equity program. We need answers now. You have community members before you ready to partner with you and bridge the gap to help our black babies thrive. But instead we are, we are being told that we must start over at the beginning to even be considered for a partnership. Make no mistakes. We are still here advocating for our students and will continue to do so. We will continue to be here and present in the community and at the board meetings. BYLP will continue to stand in the gap for our black students and be their voice. The next comment is anonymous. Hello. I'm hoping to address masking our children and staff while indoors. I think the board should fight for masks to be optional and up to each individual as to whether masks should be worn indoors. We need your help to make this happen. Teachers have had the opportunity to be vaccinated and children should not have to suffer anymore. Thank you for your time. And the last public comment is from Lisa Stanley. I am with Black Youth Leadership Project and I am writing yet another comment in complete disgust from the inaction of the board. We have consistently told board members we want change. We have waited hours at recent board meetings for a decision to be made to finally address the disproportionate discipline rates amongst our black students. Nothing has been done to address and fix problems that have existed for years. 
Nothing, even with three proposals recently presented from community organizations actively doing the work to support our students. EGUSD is choosing to ignore the needs of your community. We are concerned for the well being of our students in the fall. Superintendent Hoffman and board members, how are you okay with allowing children in your district to be intentionally harmed with implicit and complicit bias and racism towards Black students? Why have you not made Black students a priority? Why do you sit on this board if you do not intend to make significant change where it is most needed with the disproportionate discipline rates for Black students? We demand that we demand you accept the proposals by Earth Mama Healing, Black Youth Leadership Project, and Project Optimism submitted to bring the change Black students in Elk Grove need. You cannot continue to circle around the issues, pretend the district has it under control when the last three years your stats worsened. It is an absolute disgrace. Solve the problem by taking action with the organizations in place ready to go to help you. We are sick and tired and, and your lack of empathy and action. Thank you, Ms. Oriana. Move on to our consent agenda. Um, Ms. Oriana, was there a public comment to read for the consent agenda? Yes, Madam Board President Albiani, there is one from Debbie Worthington. Uh, she reads, first, I thank Dr. Or Mr. Hoffman for always addressing my questions promptly and professionally. Since an ongoing funding source has been budgeted through Technology Services General Fund for the payment of race and educational equity, I'd like to know what that entails. Are people looking for educational equality in which everyone has equal opportunities or are people expecting equal results, i.e. equity? The term equality has been recently placed with equity in the media and various organization materials, and there is a huge difference between equality and equity. Everyone should be afforded equality by having equal access to opportunities, However, it is a fact that of life that regardless of how hard people work, given the equal opportunities, not everyone has equal results. Are the students who are members of the student-led social justice organization that strives to advocate for equitable education looking for equal opportunities or equal results? It's an important distinction to consider. For example, everyone uh, may have an opportunity to apply for a certain job, equality. The fact is that not everyone who applies will get that job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call for a motion to approve items one through 26 on the consent agenda. So moved. Moved by Mr. Perez, seconded. Uh, I have a question actually. Oh, yes. Quick. Sorry, Mr. Hoffman and I attempted to have a really quick conversation about uh, a public inquiry before this. Um, Mr. Hoffman, you're gonna talk about process a little bit later, um, following up on a board request. Um, but the specific questions, is that something we could address now? No, it's not an agendized item. The question that came in was with regards to making modifications to the, the contract, um, the format that we're doing and the explanation. So Template. the board requested that be on a future agenda item. So staff is working through some ideas and we'll bring that uh, forward, but we're using the current practice um, now until we bring that item to the board for um, feedback on the new process. But that's so not on the agenda tonight um to change the process but it, it is yeah. coming understood um there were also some a few kind of examples in there um madam chair what is your wish i have two questions uh, yeah would you pull whatever you would like to pull okay. and then let's vote and we can address your questions and finish our vote please okay um, what items would you like to pull so the numbers that were cited for me here don't actually jive. So it is in the, oh my gosh, sorry, I'm going back here to get the right document. Item nine, ratification of contracts for services. Um, specific line item there, but we don't go into specifics, right? So I'll no, just- I just need to know which item number's on the agenda. Item nine. Nine and? Uh, I think it's just nine. Great. I'd like to call for a motion to approve items one through 26 minus number nine on the consent agenda. Does that first still stand? Oh, so move. No. So miss, moved by Ms. Jamerson. I'll second. Second by Dr. Martinez Salir. So roll call vote. Ms. Chair Espinoza? Aye. Mr. Forchina? 
Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Dr. Martinez Alir? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. And myself is aye is unanimous. Now you had a question on item number nine, Ms. Chair Espinoza. Yes, ma'am. Um, there was a question on what the contract with Robert Half was for. And I know that we've used that firm for uh, professional development before, but I'm trying to find it now in the description. It just says customer agreement in the description. So if someone could tell us what the services are, that would be helpful. Oh, technology services. It's a $68,000 item, if that helps. Um, that item is for, we bring in some contractors to help repair all the Chromebooks have been coming in. So we have four contractors that have been here for the last few months. And then we're gonna keep that going to help with all the maintenance and repairs going on with the Chromebooks. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, the, I think it's the only other question here. Um, same document, COVID funds allocated to the Sacramento Chinese community. That's in capitals as, a, as an organization, there's a $315,000 item. Um, and a lack of description three times. Yeah, it's, it's, it looks like it's a duplicate. I don't know if it's, yeah, it looks like it's the same item. And I can give you the number that's on page three of five. They all have different contract numbers. I looked at that also. Could I? And Good evening. The Sacramento Chinese Community Service Center is a outside provider that um, runs our after school programs and they're multi funded between ELO, which is why it says COVID and then ACES programs. That's our grant and then the 21st Century Learning Center grant. So they're all different and separate ones for that's different schools. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Those are all my questions, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, and anytime we can get questions to staff ahead of time, we don't put them on the spot here. It's, it's appreciated. Um, I need a motion to approve number nine on the consent agenda. So moved, Madam Chair. Moved by Ms. Chair Espinosa. May I have a second? Second. Aye. Second by Dr. Martina Salir. So roll call vote, Ms. Chair Espinosa. Aye. Mr. Forchina. Um, given that there has been recognition by the superintendent that the board has requested uh, an opportunity to have discussion about uh, the format of the contracts under consent agenda. Uh, I will vote yes, because uh, we do have a responsibility to pay people for work done but we also have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that the work that's being done is proper and is work that cannot be done by staff. Uh, we, we are utilizing the relief money to put a lot of money in the pockets of a lot of people for work in my opinion and others that could be done by our own staff. Uh, so I will vote yes, uh, but with the, with uh, that caveat. Okay, in the future, we'll, um, let's open up to discussion and we'll keep our votes to votes and not comments, please. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Dr. Martinez Alir? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. And myself as an aye, thank you, that's unanimous. We're moving on to bargaining units. Ms. Soriana, are there any comments from any bargaining unit members? President. Madam Board President, there are no uh, comments from bargaining unit. Thank you. We'll move ahead to discussion slash action items. Number one tonight, we're excited. We have an approval and board acceptance of a petition to appoint a pupil member to the governing board. Ms. Soriano, are there any comments related to this item? Yes, Madam Board President, Alviani, there is one from Winnie Hong. As a parent of two EGUSD students and a community member, I want to voice my full support. 
Okay, my full support for Genep's efforts to empower EGUSD students by asking the board to unanimously approve bylaw 9150. We need student voices and representation on the board to increase equity and anti-racism in our school district. I urge you to approve bylaw 9150 today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sardi. Thank you and good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. Uh, there are uh, two actually very closely related uh, board agenda items that we'll, we will be addressing. The first is the acceptance of a petition. The second is the approval of the bylaws. And I think it may be helpful for the community to have a bit of uh, just brief background information uh, on it. And then I'm uh, pleased to inform the board and the community that we'll be hearing directly from our uh, student leaders who have been part of this process. We're thrilled to have them here this evening. The background information is that on May 18th of this year, EGUS students, who I will introduce in a moment, submitted to the district a petition for the Board of Education to consider appointing a student board member. This process is defined by California Education Code 35012, so it is explicitly um, defined, the process is explicitly defined by law. Currently, the district has student representatives assigned to the board pursuant to bylaw 9150, however, the district does not currently have a student board member. So for the community, uh, oftentimes if you're watching or you're here in person, we have our high school board reps who present information about the wonderful things that are happening in their schools that is different than a seated board member. And so that's the adjustments that are being, being made to the bylaw that we'll be um, addressing this evening. So a requirement of this process is the confirmation of 500 signatures of enrolled EGUSD high school students supporting the petition. And until we had those 500 signatures confirmed, um, we couldn't bring that. And uh, we've been able to uh, confirm that on July 7th, the district con confirmed this requirement, important requirement has been met. I just wanna take a moment uh, and introduce some key people. Um, some are here, some are not. Um, but key people who have been involved in this in this process, and I'm going to hold off on the on the students till the till the very end. Um, Mr. Craig Murray, our assistant superintendent of secondary education, has been integral to this. Jane Ross, our director of college and career connections. Um, Ms. Sue Hubbard, who is here with us this evening, uh, program specialist and administrator, also in the Department of College and Career uh, Connections. We had a number of meetings. Uh, very productive and positive meetings with uh, the students, uh, but all the work couldn't be done then and Sue did a lot of work behind the scenes with the students to keep this moving. Uh, Ms. Karen Resendez, the district's legal counsel was extremely helpful to ensure that all processes uh, were, all, uh, all legal requirements were strictly adhered to. I wanna also thank two of our board members, Mr. Furchina and Ms. Jamerson for joining the group for a meeting very recently and it was extremely helpful uh, to all of us to get the perspectives of our of our board prior to bringing it to the full board. So thank you both to both of you. Um, and then I want to acknowledge uh, Tin Sabir Han, Arya Shergill, and Prer Noyogari, the three students who've been part of this process and they'll be coming up in, in just a moment. Um, and just a couple of comments uh, about the students. These students have demonstrated impressive leadership a genuine interest in strong student representation in board level matters, and most importantly, a deep desire to support the district's efforts in optimally and equitably educating every student in the district. They saw a need and did not stop at identifying the need for change. They actively became part of the solution. They are role models for how to appropriately and effectively become civically engaged in improving the educational experience of students and supporting the community in which they live. They truly are to be commended for their efforts. In addition to being bright, respectful, thoughtful, and engaging people, they also recognize the value of positive partnerships. From the outset, they were open to collaborating with the district to ensure all legal procedural requirements were adhered to, and they recognized that this collaborative effort would result in the best possible recommendation coming forward to the board. The details of board bylaw 9150 have been provided to the board last Friday for your review and the pertinent documents were attached to the board agenda and they can also be accessed on the district's website um, through the uh, this agenda item. At this point, I would love to invite our students to come up and join me at the dais and they're going to walk you through a brief 
uh, presentation that really focuses on the group that they are uh, associated with and they are leaders of the Gen Up group and also the why behind their petition. They have, uh, they'll be able to very, um, I think very effectively explain why they find this as an interest. And so if you would join me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Surdi, for the introduction. And now, as he said, we'll present um, our short little presentation explaining the why and um, how we got to this point. Um, first, the pictures of us um, to introduce ourselves. My name is Tinsai Burhanu. I'm the co-president of the Elk Grove Gen Up chapter, um, which started last August. Um, and I'm also a rising junior at Kasim Silks High School. Um, hello, my name is Prior Niall Gary. I am a rising senior at Kasuma Soaks High School, and I am also the director of school board relations for our Genup chapter. Hello, I'm Arya Shergill. I'm the co-director of school board relations, and I am a rising sophomore at Kasuma Soaks High School. What is Genup? Genup is a student-led social justice organization that strives to advocate for equitable education through the power of youth voices. We started our chapter last summer in the hopes of uplifting student voices and speaking on important matters that aren't being addressed in the district. The student board member campaign is important to us because we believe that students who are the primary stakeholders in education should be represented in the decision-making process for our public schools. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so the decisions that are made by our Elk Grove Unified School District Board of Education have a very important and direct impact on the lives of students. Um, because of this, it is imperative and um, that the student body of EJUSD has meaningful and equitable representation on this governing board. Um, and we both morally and legally are entitled to such representation. And by installing this position, uh, us students will have our needs addressed and it will also provide the opportunity for a student voice in a governing position. And so thank you for that, Tensei. And last but not least, we would like to thank all of the members of our Gen Up team for all of their hard work and dedication into making this campaign happen. And we'll like to do that for the next two slides. And we would also like to extend our appreciation to all of the district leaders who helped support us with this campaign. It truly wouldn't have been possible without you. And with all that said, we'd like to thank the board members for listening to our presentation and open it up for any questions regarding our presentation or the proposal. Start on my left, Mr. Press. Congratulations, you did it <laughs> in record time. Um, I've been um, advocating um, for the district to have student rights long time ago. And I hope that be on your agenda because, you know, it's long overdue. You know, students have rights to engage, to participate in a variety of social activities within our educational academic institutions. So now that'd be my number one concern for your agenda. I would like you to pursue. Number two is also a suggestion on your presentation. You had excellent presentation on your representation, but I like to also see what schools they represented or from, because that's a very important that Every school has some type of input on on the, on your uh, presentation. Looks like you do, but yet on paper it looks better, you know. Okay, and and I know that the city of El Grove has a, a youth representation group. Have anybody within your your knowledge with your group participate or know of that, and or are they participating in the mayor? Mayor of Elk Grove's uh, Youth uh, Commission. Yes, I'm. I was a. I was a member of the Youth Commission, the Elk Grove Youth Commission. Uh, it's very good. Are you also planning to continue doing that? Because I think that's very important that uh, that we have 
interlocking or networking with the city of Elk Grove because there's a lot of resources with it for youth that needs to be articulated also to you know Elk Grove Unified School District, but also to the city of Elk Grove. And also that also applies for other cities within our school boundaries. And so uh, I want you to be aware of that because there's a variety of uh, political uh, education, I mean, the municipals that we should have ties of networking for you. And also that opens the door for you to speak out to those individuals for youth jobs. That's another issue that I know that they have access to that because I really uh, wish that we have more youth jobs for our youth within this region. And we need to give early job, education, vocational educational experience to youth. You're getting civic engaged, but hands-on. That's what I'd like to see. And you to advocate for summer youth jobs for youth within our district. Um, also, we're in the headquarters of California. Uh, and there's a lot of jobs within the variety of institutions for the state of California. In fact, they have a youth aid position for students who could work in state government. Uh, after you graduate, you could apply for student assistance when you go to uh, uh, beyond your high school and graduate student positions. But youth aids within a variety of departments such as Department of Transportation, Department of Education, or whatever interests that youth within our community, they have uh, the opportunity to apply for jobs. And, uh, and, and they're there, but yet nobody knows they're there. And, and we need to expose and put pressure on these individuals and directors for different departments to get us a job position for youth in our community because you are the future of California, you know, uh, and, and I have a lot of faith within our youth because when I was your age, I wasn't as student as you. <laughs> my my, uh, my uh, ambitions were in sports. I was narrow-minded, but, you know, later going to college, I had to broaden that out and, and get that balance of academic, sports, religion, you know, and spiritualism and all that. So um, I congratulate you all for your hard work and your dedication and wish you all the best. Oh, one more thing. Also our institutions, our college institutions within our this region, we, they are recruiting students and they have slots for students within our district. And they're waiting for you to transition. And, and, and I like to see more students transition at the, at the junior high, not just the junior high, the junior, I mean, junior uh, grade level. You know, a lot of students I see, even myself, uh, I think I could have, ex you know, graduated school within three years versus four years. And, you know, students are very ambitious. They could do that. And I think there is some talk to, to do this. And we need those links to those institutions to be on our campuses, to give you some introduction classes. So think about that and also transition, get those recruiters from these colleges, the UC systems uh, throughout California, the state universities, the junior colleges, get them on our campuses. And, and they're looking for well-educated students like you that we produce annually. And we just need the network and hard work of students like you to continue doing this, these objectives. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Jamerson. Good evening, ladies. Thank you again for a great presentation. I'm really excited about this opportunity. I think that this is really um, the right step to continue to center student needs and address issues of equity. Uh, in our district. So I'm, I'm excited and I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Dr. Martinez-Solier. I'd like to thank you for your presentation and coming out. Um, I know sometimes presenting can be a little bit nerve wracking, but you did a very well job presenting and um, you're very uplifting in your presentation. 
And I'm very hopeful that having a student seat and a student voice is key so we can hear your experience and your feedback, but also hopeful in that one day you will be our future leaders. And hopefully one day you will be maybe a board member up here, who knows down the road. So again, um, again, congratulations and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chair Espinoza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, ladies, congratulations to you and to everybody else that's been involved. I know it's actually been a long road. I've been hearing from some of you for, for a while on this, so I know you've been working on it for some time. Um, I'm ready to support the petition. I just wanted to point out one thing in the uh, member application that's included here as an attachment. The training requirements are actually higher than they are for us. So, um, you know, we, we may have some learning going in, in multiple directions here. I, I personally wish we would all impose on ourselves trainings and boardsmanship, the Brown Act, Robert's Rules of Order, ethics. I think that would be fully appropriate. So hopefully uh, we will catch up to our student representative sometime soon. Um, so with that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Forchina. Thank you. Um, once again, uh, I say thank you to the three of you. Um, proud of you. Proud of everybody in, in your organization. Uh, and um, having listened to the three of you um, tonight and previously, uh, I know we have a lot of great students that can fill the position. And I really am hopeful that it's one of the three of you. Thank you again. Mr. Yang. Hello, ladies. I just want to say congratulations first and foremost to you three and your colleagues. Um, and I want to say thank you for uh, what you do, um, taking the leadership role to represent um, El Grove Unified School District uh, students. Um, I am really big on development um, in terms of the area of self-reliance, leadership, uh, public speaking, financial literacy, civic engagement, public affair, and then diversity. And I would want you guys to advocate those areas to your peers, how important they are, because eventually uh, when you go on to college or life, that will propel you to be your best in any future opportunity that you may um, may be present to you. So I just want you guys to advocate on those for your peers to 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 very focus on development on those. But thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you very much, ladies, for your presentation. I, I, we appreciated a moment to to meet you and we'll look forward to more interaction. Um, I think building a strong community of people with like that work to work together will, will get you far in life. It's, it's a very nice base that you're creating for yourselves and for others. And I appreciate the manner you worked with the district and I appreciate the work with the district to get this done. It's very exciting to all of us. Thank you again, Madam President. Just uh, one other quick item before I um, respectfully um, recommend to the board uh, to take action. And that is, I wanna make sure it was, uh, it was about a two month process from the point of the receipt um, of the petition. The students, um, the team here did a, a fabulous job of gathering uh, signatures from interested students. And then we have to go through and verify all of those, all of those signatures. And while that work was taking place, um, because of the fact uh, they didn't have to function in the way that they did. They could have worked completely separate from us and brought a recommendation. Um, and I don't want to give, and the reason I'm sharing this is these are their ideas. So I, um, Ms. Chairs Espinoza, I appreciate you seeing the quality and the standards that they have set up. Um, that's coming from them. They have very, very high standards, but at the core of it also is their interest to ensure that it is an opportunity that is available to any student interested, uh, high school student in our district, um, and that uh, the, the training and the preparation is also available uh, to them. And the other thing that's a bit unique is that there's a, there will be a, a different timeline this year than there will in years moving forward. So I just wanna note, um, there should be, we should have 
everything goes smoothly, um, and we anticipate it will, there will, would be a, uh, a board member seated in September. And then moving forward, it would be a um, July 1 to June 30 is what will happen. So the, the actual election process will be this next coming spring is when, when it will take place. So just want to note, because when the petition came forward, they're the first coming out of the gate to set this up for years to come. And so they, they did double duty and did a very nice job of setting up a good timeline for this year and then moving forward. Thank you. And with that, I respectfully request the board to approve acceptance of the student petition to begin the process for the appointment of a pupil member to the governing board. Thank you. I'd like to call for a motion to approve acceptance of the student petition to begin the process for appointment of a pupil member to the governing board. I uh, move approval. I second it. Moved by Mr. Porcina, seconded by Mr. Perez. It's a roll call vote, Mr. Porcina? Yes. Ms. Jamerson? Yes. Dr. Martina Salier? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. Mr. Yang? Yes. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Yes. And I, for myself, it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is... A The next item is approval of board bylaw 9150. Ms. Soriano, is there any public comment related to this item? No, Madam Board, I had already read it. Thank you. Mr. Cerruti. Thank you again, Madam President. The Board of Education is respectfully requested to approve the updated board bylaw 9150, specific to student board members. I'd like to call for a motion to approve board bylaw, bylaw 9150, student board members. So moved. Moved by Ms. Jamerson. Second. Second in by Dr. Martina Salier. It's a roll call vote. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Dr. Martina Salier? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Aye. Mr. Porcina? Aye. And myself, it's unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Work nice well done. work, ladies. We didn't have student reports. That is definitely the highlight of the meeting. <laughs> um, our next item is a public hearing. We'll have a second hearing regarding proposed composition of by trustee area maps. Mr. Pierce. Thank you, President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. Uh, that's a hard act to follow, but I will do my best. Uh, that's an exciting um, item that the board heard, um, absolutely. So um, as the president announced, this is the second public hearing with regard to the review of draft maps for the uh, potential change to the trustee area um, maps. So I have with me tonight again, like we've had throughout this process, uh, Mr. Mike Smith with Lozano Smith and Ms. Shalise Tilton with National Demographics Corporation. And uh, we will try to get through this um, pretty quickly tonight, we hope. So just to talk again about process, and I think it's important for the board, the community um, to see our process. The board will recall that on May 4th, they did adopt a resolution of intent uh, to change their election system. Um, that was the priority number one, if you will, of this board um, when this process began. And at that time, we also had our first pre-draft uh, map hearing. Uh, we followed that on May 18th with the second pre-draft map hearing. Um, we sought direction. Uh, we did not receive any public comment during that process. And then we moved to June 15th where the board held its first hearing uh, to review three draft maps. And you've already conducted that hearing. Tonight's agenda is the essentially the fourth public hearing, um, but the second on your consideration of draft maps. Uh, we will ask the board to hold a final hearing with a map adoption at August 10th. We have a date here that's shown as to be determined. I'll talk about that a little bit uh, more here in a second with the county committee, where they will have a hearing and a vote on the change of your election system, as well as the maps that you adopt. And then we have here now, it's a new line item, September 9th and 10th is the State Board of Education meeting. 
Um, that's where your election waiver consideration will happen as a consent item on the State Board of Education. It's a two day meeting. And then in early October, we anticipate receiving the official release of California census population data. And then by March 1 of 2022, uh, we would be asking the board to adopt map adjustments to reflect that new census data. So we wanted just to talk again about um, what we've done and I've talked about the hearings, so we don't need to reiterate on those. I do want to express again to the board and the community that all of our public hearings are maps, the processes, and all this information has been publicly available through multiple communications. And I wanna thank Ms. Soriano for helping us with that, um, but also uh, noticed in newspapers of general circulation um, and also uh, through a dedicated web page and link. And again, I wanna thank communications as well as Kathleen Watt and Tech Services for helping with that. Uh, tonight's public hearing does represent the final hearing on the consideration of maps. And again, August 10th is intended for you to adopt one of the three alternative maps, which will allow you to finalize your process of making the change to a by trustee area election, which has been our priority. Um, the first bullet here, the board will recall that there was a request of us made to add census block data and school site information on the interactive maps that have been made publicly available and shared with the board. We've completed that work. Again, the State Board of Education waiver has been submitted and accepted by the State Board of Education staff. I do wanna um, thank um, Lozano Smith for their guidance through that process. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the DLAC and the DAC committees for their work when we engage them and their feedback in the process, as well as each of our bargaining units. It was a fairly large undertaking to get that second bullet completed. Um, we have already begun, uh, Superintendent Hoffman, myself, and Mike Smith, uh, to engage the county office of education, um, Mr. Gordon, as well as their legal counsel to get a date certain for the county committee um, to follow your action with action of their own. And then again, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Once that 2020 census data becomes available, we anticipate that being done in October. And then you get to start this process completely over with regard to looking at new trustee areas. So, I just want to add for the board's sake um, and the community's sake, um, one very plausible outcome of your action on August 10th, uh, just to make this clear, is to adopt your existing trustee areas based on the 2010 census data, which is the gold standard and the only data that you're available to look at in those trustee maps. So um, again, with the intent of making the election system change, the law does require all of these arduous processes that we've taken you through. Um, so again, very plausible outcome. Um, our concern from a staff perspective is you make modifications to your trustee area maps now. They're done out of context with regard to the 2020 census data. And then you're gonna just make changes again, um, starting in October as we work um, towards that March deadline to, uh, to balance your trustee areas based on the new population data. And I will turn it over to Ms. Tilton to take us through the rest of the presentation. Shalise, can you hear me? Sorry, there you go. You want to hear me too. <laughs> oh, you're good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, what you're seeing on the screen is a demographic summary of the entire school district with um, the estimate that with the population count for 2010. As was mentioned earlier, we must use the population, the total population for 2010. We know when 2020 comes out that that population is going to be much higher. We're estimating it's going to be about 40, 41,000 people more than what the 2010 is, but the law requires we use 2010 um, when you're switching from your hybrid system to your bi-district system, you also have to um, adopt a map along with it. So uh, that's what we are, that, that's this half of the process that we're going through. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this map is showing um, the existing map with the current trustee areas. The top line is the total population in 2010. And then we're estimating, as I mentioned, that 2020 is going to be about uh, 40, 
1,000 people more. And um, so that second line shows you where we think that population growth is. And you will see that districts six and seven are going to be disproportionately have too many people in them um, once we have to use the 2020 census data. Next slide. This is a continuation of the demographic summary of some information that is considered when you're looking at maps, such as um, household income, age, immigration status. This, these categories will be much more meaningful when you're adjusting the boundaries after the 2020 census data comes at, came out, but comes out. But as we mentioned, for this exercise, we must use the 2010 data. Next slide. Just to provide alternatives when you are considering adopting a map that goes with your 2010 data, we did provide a couple of alternatives. And the only reason why we provided these alternatives, and, and I should be clear that, that this map, map you're adopting tonight will not be used for any elections. It will be replaced by a new map when the 2020 census comes out late this year and you'll be adopting that new map before March 1st. But we did go through the exercise to see if we could perhaps take the existing districts, if you for some reason chose not to adopt the existing trustee areas, we wanted to provide alternatives of maybe we underpopulate, we put fewer people in six and seven because we know in 2020, there's gonna be more people. That's why we provided alternatives one and two. What we learned from going through that exercise is that we are no, nowhere, nowhere close to being where we would need to be with the 2020 data. So um, an idea that we could perhaps get close to what 2020 would look like with any of these alternative maps, it's, it will not happen. Next slide. <clears throat> to show you the um, existing trustee areas, this is the existing trustee area, area map. It is population balanced, obviously, because when you adopted it, you adopted it on 2010 census data and it was population balanced. When we're looking um, to 2020, however, it's not going to be population balanced. And so we will need to make adjustments at that time. But we do have, um, good solid representation of the Hispanic community in, in particular districts. And uh, it actually in several distri districts, there is good representation of your citizen voting age population for your uh, Hispanic community communities and also your Asian Pacific Islander communities. Next slide, please. This is alternative one. This, as I mentioned, was an attempt to see, hey, could we produce a map that might look like the 2020 map? In producing it, we found no, we're, we're not even close. Just to give you an idea, each of the districts would have to, in 2020, we'll have to have about 50,700. And the highest district right here, um, which would be District 7, is way off. It's, it, it has would have too many people at 59,287. So there's no way that uh, this particular um, version of a map would be able to be adopted for 2020. The next map. Alternative number two was similar, just uh, trying in different areas to also possibly put fewer people in six and seven to see if we get close to what a 2020 map could look like. But we, again, are still way off to what the idea uh, of being possibly population balanced for 2020. The next slide. This is a summary of all of the three maps, um, just showing them side by side. They're all very equal as far as representation of our ethnic and um, protected class groups as far as the citizen voting age population. So there's no map that is better than one than one as far as that goes. But um, as Rob mentioned, um, it would be unnecessary confusion to adopt an alternative map at this point that's not going to be used and that's not going to be able to stand up to the 2020 district numbers. The next map, but we do need to go through the exercise and we've gone through the exercise and the board does need to ultimately decide on a map that it prefers to adopt along with its switch to a by district system. 
So um, this is this will be the last of my slides. And the question that we're asking of the board is which map you prefer, um, which map makes sense. And do you have any requests to revise any of these maps? Again, knowing that none of these maps would be ultimately be used um, for an election because we'll be doing this exercise again after the first of the year. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So Mike and Shalise and I are here to answer any questions. Um, I do want to thank their work in this. You know, it just feels like COVID has affected literally everything that we have done as an organization. Um, so, you know, this has been a challenge for us because COVID has had a dramatic uh, effect on our plan to do your election system change. We wholeheartedly accept um, the fact that we don't have the census data that we need to make your trustee area maps, yet the law hasn't changed to allow you to waiver from at least considering alternative maps. So I do wanna thank Mr. Perez for his outreach today. He had some great questions for me um, along these lines and I would open this um, up okay. to the board. Mr. Uh, can we, Mr. Pierce, can we go back one slide? You Do you want, you want us to tell you tonight which map we prefer? I'm gonna let Mr. Smith weigh in just to ensure, but I believe the answer is no, Mike, but I'll let you weigh in on that. Or are we asking for these questions to be answered on the 10th? You will make a final decision on August 10th. That's the board meeting in which you'll actually choose a map and we'll define the election sequencing that's required by law. But of course, for election sequencing purposes, we'll just be using the existing sequencing, which is three trustees up for election in 2022 and the remaining trustees up for election in 2024. So if you wanted to give National Demographics any direction to alter any of these maps or to come back with new maps, if that were your uh, desire, then we would need to have that input tonight so that any new map and its election sequencing could be published at least seven days before the August 10th board meeting. But if you are feeling comfortable with what you've heard so far and that your, um, your likely direction is to probably adopt the existing map, then you don't need to express any particular preferences tonight. So tonight is not a decision-making night, but you uh, feel free to ask questions or give direction uh, about any potential changes that you might like to see. Okay, so tonight is a public hearing and we've been introduced the same information that we've been introduced to other times. Um, the purpose was to get us shown and fulfill the requirements. The action we're looking for is to have the hearing. So Ms. Soriano, are there any comments from the public on our maps? Madam Board President Almeida, there are no public comments related to this item. Okay, thank you. And then I'm just gonna start to my right. If you had any questions, I, I'm gonna go. Well, I have a question regarding the I guess the process, why, why, why do we have to choose today a map? You're not, you would not be choosing a map tonight. We're not you, choosing a map tonight. Or what, what or choosing which to one? To the mic, like. sir, the, the mic, the mic, so, so the public can. Or, or which one do we like? It's, uh, why, why ask us if which one, which map do we like? It's, 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 same thing. Those questions are as much to the public at this point um, as they are to the board. Uh -huh. um, these have been public hearings to gather public input. The board is also welcome to give us feedback. Uh -huh. um, because the reason why I say this is because in, in the presentation, uh, the consultant stated that uh, that the 59,000 in Mr. Forcino's was way out of line or those, those numbers. And we could go by those numbers for uh, map number one or map number two. Yeah, I those, think- Those do not work in, in, this, in this process. So why, why even say, I don't like number two or I don't like number one? Because the fact that the, the consultant says they, those numbers don't work. Yeah, I've come to the same conclusion you have. I think this process is about changing it to by district. And then the map discussion needs to be when we have the current data. 
So, so, but this is a process that is required by law, and I, and I don't want to not give someone an opportunity to speak that's on the board. We, we asked the public, and I'll just run down the line, and if anybody had anything they wanted to add, I'm going to give them an option because I'm not about shutting people down. Okay. And then we'll close the public hearing. So did anybody have anything they wanted to add? My paper clips on the right side. I'm supposed to start with Mr. Yang today, <laughs> right now. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. So we are making comment, but we're not voting on anything, right? We're not voting. And I, I personally don't have a comment. I think it's been made clear, but I just want to make sure if anybody had any questions. Not at this point. You're good. Okay. Mr. Porcina? No. Ms. Chair Espinoza? Dr. Martina Salir? No. Ms. Jamerson? No. Mr. Perez? <laughs> No more? Uh, yes, I'm gonna have to ask some questions. Okay. And also some point of information. Um, it's my understanding at the county, Sacramento County Education Board meeting, Mr. Gordon stated that we should be getting maybe or 19, I mean, 2020 census data from August 10th to the September. And not those exact words, but he said between those dates that we should be getting those. And that, that, that he told his board members that we will be part, they will be part of the process of approving the board yeah, we all we all thought that at one point, Mr. Perez. Though, those those were the dates we thought that was going to happen, but now it's now it looks like October. So what? When Mr. Gordon made if he made that statement, uh -huh. that was a date that we all thought was going to be accurate, mm -hmm. and it's just not accurate. It's going to be it's going to be October, maybe November, but uh, we're hope, we're hopeful of for October. What I can share, what I can ensure the board of is as soon as that data is available, mm -hmm. we will start this work. Okay. Um. Page four, um, just to get more better understanding, on the first bullet, you have population estimates by census tract. What, what population estimates years are those? 2010? Shalise, can you address that? He's referring to the census block data that we added to the interactive maps. Yes, it's 2010. Source data, 2010? Mm -hmm. 2010. And so, 2010. Um, I, one of the issues I had going through this report, and I talked to Mr. Pierce about earlier, was when you referred to the county committee hearing, that I want to make sure to the public that's out there also, we are referring to, when we say the county committee hearing, we are referring to the Sacramento Education Board County. Is that correct? That's well, correct. If the, the county committee on school district reorganization is the technical uh, name for that. In Sacramento okay. County, the County Board of Education um, has chosen to make itself the County Committee on School District Organization. In other counties, it's a larger group of 11. And so in some counties, it's the County Board of Education. In some counties, it's a separate board. So you're correct to point out that it, it's in effect the County Board of Education that will be conducting the County Committee hearing for Elk Grove. And they do that for all the school districts within Sacramento County, correct? Yes, any yeah. school district who's got most of its territory within Sacramento County, then they would be the county committee that would have to approve uh, the change from uh, moving from your at-large hybrid system into the by-trustee area election system. Okay. And again, at the bottom of page four, it says, when the 2020 census data is available, the board will again consider a map revision to ensure the trustee areas 
are balanced and consistent with the law. Um, what, for the public, what law are you referring to? <laughs> there is a, an education code section that says that any district that elects their trustees by trustee areas, and at that point, that will be Elk Grove because you presumably will uh, vote to change from an at-large to by a trustee area consistent with your first resolution. So once you've adopted a system of having trustee areas, then every 10 years, starting with the 2020 census data, you'll have to population balance those seven trustee areas. So you'll be doing that consistent with the requirements of federal law that require this population balancing. So it's both state law and federal law that are at play here that require this population balancing every 10 years. Okay. Uh, uh, in the future, can you possibly actually uh, state that law for people in the community? I know what you're talking about, but people in the community, you know, they need to understand that we're complying with federal and state law and education, no codes also. Thank you. We can do that. Okay. On page five, Well, I had a here. I know how you arrived at the 44,856. Can you explain that to the community how you arrived at 44,856 that each uh, district should have those numbers equal to or above? Uh, yes, I can explain that. The the 44,856 residents for each of the seven trustee areas is based on the total population count for all people residing in within the boundaries of the school district as of 2010. So divided by the seven trustee areas, which then gives you that ideal number of just less than 45,000 per trustee area. And then each of the trustee areas will be population balanced with uh, some deviation that's allowed plus or minus 5% for a total deviation that cannot exceed 10%. So the goal is to take your total population of the, right now using 2010 census data and then get as close as we can to that ideal. And each of the three proposed maps does that. Then once you've changed to by trustee area voting, we will look at 2020 census data and we'll have to alter the boundaries because of the growth in trustee areas six and seven so that we hit the new target because of the increase of the total population by that approximately 40,000 40, and change. And so there'll be a new ideal and we'll population balance using the 2020 data. Correct. And then on page five on the top, your ACS, America Community Survey Population Estimates, that was for the 2010 data set, correct? That's based on the 2015 through 2019 American Community Survey. Oh, okay. So that explains it. So that's used. Why? In other words, that data is separate and apart from the census data. It's a different survey tool. Yes, I understand that, but I assume that I wasn't sure, but that's why I asked that if that represented 2010 data. So it was tw uh, from, okay, from 2015 to 2019 data. Um, and you divide that number by seven and you arrived at 44,856? Uh, no. We do, the only number that um, is divided by seven is the total population for 2010. So what, what, what was your total to arrive at 44,856? What numbers did you use? It's the, tw the 2010 total population of 313,989. So use 2010 data, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I don't understand. Um, why did you use 2015-19 data 
on that count versus using 2010 data. The ACS information is useful for showing how well the communities reflect, how well the trustee areas reflect communities of interest. So that is why we provide that data so that um, someone who is analyzing the maps can have the most recent data based on the categories of citizen voting age population by race and ethnicity, and also categories such as um, households, household, the language spoken at home per household, language fluency, education, household income, um, various data that helps us to understand, help us understand communities of interest. That's why that data is provided. But you're exactly right. It's not, it's not used to balance the population of the districts. Only the 2010 total population count is used. So that whole page is, is uh, this whole page data set is from the 2015-2019 ACS population estimates. Uh, the right hand, the right hand column is from the 2015 to 2019 ACS population estimate, as is on the left hand column, the city citizen voting age population. So well, they're bo both columns are from the 2015, 2019? The, the entire right hand column is from the 2015, 2019 ACS. Uh -huh. And then the left-hand column, only uh, the citizen voting age population. And in that, I know you, it's very small on the screen, but there's a little footnote that explains each of the data categories. So, so okay, I'm, I'm mixed up here. So on that column to the left, is that 2010 data sets, the whole column, all the totals, total population, citizen voting age pop, Voter registration, voter turnout, voter turnout, November 28th. Oh, no, they couldn't be. <laughs> I see what you're saying. No, okay. Uh, total population and uh, assistant voting ages. What, what year is that data set? The total population is yes. from 2010. Okay. The second line says estimated population, and that's what we're estimating the 2020 will be. So, uh, okay, I got it. So the total population, citizen voting age pop, those two um, rows are from 2010, correct? Uh, actually, the citizen voting age population is from the ACS from the 2015 to 2019 data. Oh, it is? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through this process as soon as we get the, the same process when we receive the 2020 date census data, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Now, how much deviation can each school district have? I mean, each school district uh each uh, board district can be five or or is above 10 on cert certain circumstances or what so if you look at your least populated trustee area and you compare it to your greatest populated trustee area that difference can be no greater than 10 percent so as as your uh, legal counsel advises Good to stay within 5% of the ideal. Say that again, I, I didn't quite understand. So there, the, the total deviation between the smallest, uh, the, the trustee area with the fewest number of people and the trustee area with the greatest number of people, there can only be a 10% difference. Okay. No, lowest, greatest. Okay, on page six, um, you use a, a estimate population 2020. Where do you get that data set on that call, on that row? That 
that estimated population is an, is provided by NDC demographers. It's based on the American Community Survey and then adjusted for um, known errors in the American Community Survey when they're counting group quarters and other categories. So on NDC's website, there's a whole page that explains the entire methodology, but it starts with using the ACS information and then adjust it for those undercounts. So, so there's the ACS 2020 out already? The ACS information covers from 2015 to 2019. Okay, yeah. Well, I noticed in that row, uh, almost within uh, district two, three, four, five, six, seven, everything has gone up, you know, at maybe an average of maybe three to 4,000, maybe more in six and seven. And mine in area one, it's gone down. Why is that? In area one, 44,000. So 40, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not changed much. We're estimating that's not changed much. We don't, we don't know for sure until the actual numbers come out. These are just estimates. Yes, but I, I'm very familiar with my community and there has been a lot of infill of new homes and apartments, multi, uh, mul couple of multi. And so, Mr. Perez, Mr. Perez, we're we're going to get the real numbers. I mean, yes, I understand get, that. You'll, but... you'll, you'll know you'll know exactly what um, if it's grown or if it's shrunk. But we'll have real instead of we're working with as good estimates as we can. But you're going to get the actual numbers. Right. Well, I was just concerned, you know. But the 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 numbers will be what the numbers are, and we'll get we'll get the accurate data um, through the census release. Yeah. Do you have any other questions, Mr. Perez? Yeah, one more. No, hold on here. Um. Can we request another um, contractor? I'm not following the question, Mr. Perez. Another contractor. Insight, you know, like, you know, like, for instance, let me ask you this before I even answer, answer back that one. This is the same contractor that we had in 2010. That's correct. Okay. Um, but yet, okay. And today, yeah, do we have the option to request from another contractor input suggestions? That's certainly at the board's purview. I would tell you that every demographer mm -hmm. that's worth anything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is completely inundated doing this state and nationwide mm -hmm. because of the census data. Mm -hmm. um, you may recall some of our earlier conversations mm -hmm. where we made the recommendation that we contract with NDC now mm -hmm. so that we assure we not only have them through this process, but we can assure we have their attention and we're a priority for them when the 2020 census data arrives. Um, I certainly don't want to speak for Lozano Smith, but NDC is held in really high regard. They are experts in this field. Um, my recommendation as staff would be that we we utilize them and we rely on their data. Okay. What about a consultant to give some input from from a, a civil rights perspective? Mr. Perez? 
you, you were you were it was great you met with him prior we're heading on to 20 minutes of your questions on the same presentation we've had four times so um you've said you if you have further concerns can we bring them up directly <laughs> it, we're, we're moving to a by district vote that's the yes. only thing we're trying to appropriate right now yes, you, and you if you vote. have a concern when we get the 2020 data of something that didn't happen in this process can, i am more than happy to have you talk to him about it talk to me about it whoever you want but i don't think tonight's when we have to do that sir we need to get to the by district point and we just need to close the hearing and then we're going to get there and then when we have the 2020 data i understand the civil rights idea uh -huh. I, I hear you and I, I've actually been learning a lot about that lately. So if they cannot show to your satisfaction why they, they don't take that into consideration and you wanna bring it up at a board meeting or something, I would support you, sir. But tonight, I think we're just in a, in a process to get to the point where then we can still make those decisions. Right, so, so tonight is the time to talk about alternate services uh consultant services to give uh, uh, another viewpoint or 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 uh suggestions from suggestions another perspective to, suggestions to maps what suggestions to map to maps yeah not, the data not not to re determine who the consultants going to be in the work no 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 no, down that no, road. Yeah, no I'm just, i just threw that out but yet you know that that's i i've seen districts weren't happy with their uh, demographers and they changed the demographers. I've seen uh, uh, districts request outside services consultants to give input like civil rights groups that are, are, are who have challenged other school districts uh, from being voted in at large to the, transition the, to by district, Mr. voting Perez. by district. And Mr. so it, it's just something that we could get another ear of and support and consultation. Mr. Perez. It's nothing that Mr. putting Perez. our present contractor down. Mr. Just, Perez. What? Oh. That's what these public hearings are for. Right. Anyone that We're wants to anyone that wants to engage with us uh -huh. can. Right. Right now, folks haven't done that in this process. They may want to do it. I I, I my bet would be that we'll have more community engagement. Uh -huh when we actually go to change the maps than we are in this process, because this process is just changing the election system. Right. And no one is really opposed to doing the bi-district election. Yes. But when we actually move some lines yep. and people are represented by different, uh, then I think more groups will. So that will be the opportunity for other groups to engage with us and share their perspectives. And they are public hearings and they're wide open for folks to be able to um, share their perspective. So that will be part of the, that is why we do public hearings. So anyone that wants to be part of that, an organization mm -hmm. or an individual citizen can engage with us. And they will, I think more of that will happen. I know this is a little frustrating in that we haven't had a great deal of public engagement, but I think in this process, they understand we're just changing the election system and that's really not controversial not changing the election system is actually more controversial than changing the election system. But when we actually go to get the census data and people go, wait a minute, I've been in you know district five for 25 years. I don't wanna to go to district six. Then we're gonna get, I think that's when we'll get engaged with, with folks. But right now it's just not that engaging because it's the, the process we're doing right now is relatively simple. Exactly, I agree with you. But yet I'm speaking myself as a board member who wants to know or inquiring if we could do this or that. And, and it seems like our, our chairman doesn't want to go there or seek no, just I just, I'm just trying to seek knowledge what as a board member, what I could do or we could do as a board. Nobody has told us, can we consult with another uh, redistricting uh, consultant or, you know, I just threw that question out there just to see, get some feedback. Yeah, there's not, uh, there's not it's not to fight. say that I'm not pleased with this contractor, but I'm just seeking uh, more information, the do's and don'ts that we can do. Um, and I don't see anything wrong with that because- One comment this, I might add here. Decision, we're, what? 
But one comment I might add here is that if we were to look at this process from a civil rights perspective, in right. other words, what would the plaintiffs want? What would the organization that, that normally sues school districts, what would they want you to do? So let's right. look at this from a civil rights perspective. And they would say, Elk Grove, we want you to change from an at-large election system to a by-trustee area election system. So right. you are embracing a civil rights perspective by your mm -hmm. willingness to change the manner in which your trustees are elected. And so irrespective of whatever demographer you might be using, you're already embracing a decision that moves away from racially polarized voting, that tries to increase representation, that is trying to balance your trustee areas, looking at how the Hispanic, the Asian, the African-American, other protected classes to ensure that they can influence the outcome of your elections. And once you change from an at-large to a bi-trustee area system, you will have complied with California's Voting Rights Act, which is the most rigorous Voting Rights Act in the United States, because the Federal Voting Rights Act, as a result of a couple of recent US Supreme Court decisions, is now weakened. Mm -hmm. So what you are doing tonight is you are embracing the civil rights movement with respect to voting. So I affirm your concern, and you're doing it. Right. Um, um, and, I, and I'm very concerned that we do it right in 2021, because this is going to, um, this process or this decision is going to affect the whole, this whole uh, district for 10, the next 10 years. And so I want to make sure, I feel that, you know, and I spoke to Mr. Pierce, he's very, he understands the concerns I have and that, that we, I want to make sure that we do it right. And, and also the fact that I don't want to have any legal challenges, uh, uh, coming forth or or somebody says well you disenfranchised me uh you i was in district seven now i'm in, in district one and we don't have no nothing in common you know there's a, a railroad in, in between us uh the socioeconomic uh, community demographics is completely different We're your concerns our are are valid and, right. and, and they should be and will be addressed once the 2020 census data is out and we're looking at making more dramatic changes to the trustee areas. So I, I think that your comments or concerns are probably premature at this moment, but they're valid and they will be addressed. Right. Well, they may be premature, but uh, I've always been in preventive mode. <laughs> That's good, good, thank you. Um, well, thank you for your presentation. It was excellent and uh, and uh, hope to hear from you <laughs> very soon. <Hey. laughs> All right, I'd like to close the public hearing and we're moving on to discussion items. Our first discussion item tonight is a board self-assessment and superintendent's evaluation feedback. Ms. Soriano, are there any public comments related to this item? Um, I happen to know there are none. There are none. Because um, I was told the total, and we've had all our public comments but I will double check with her just for the, to circle back. Mr. Hoffman. Thank you very much. Uh, so we do have uh, Mike Merchant uh, with the Arbinger Institute who is going to, uh, to join us. Uh, we'll hear his voice uh, shortly. I did want to just give the board uh, just a quick um, update. This is really designed to be a, a relatively short item. And, and this is actually the kickoff of letting our public know that we are uh, moving forward with work that the board's asked us to uh, to do. Yes. Ms. Soriano, is there any public comment related to this item? For Madam Board President Albiani, there are only public comments on discussion item number two. On two, okay, thank you. Number two. Thank you for letting me interrupt. I would have forgot. I'm yep, no problem. Forget. Um, so this is, we're moving forward with the board. Uh, action that they, they, they made us the, the direction to move forward with doing a self-evaluation for the board um, itself. It's part of the, uh, the protocols that we put in place. We've actually had it in place for a while, but now we're actually moving forward and putting the, um, the tool in place. So, and based on the board evaluation tool, we'll also develop a superintendent um, tool so that the two are um, intertwined in a way that as the board, the, the board sets goals, um, for staff to pull uh, and get done um, over a given period of time, those become 
the goals that end up in my evaluation so that they're so that they they work seamlessly together. So tonight is just the opportunity to let the um, let our public know that we're we're engaging in this process. Uh, Mr. Merchant will go through um, a short PowerPoint that will just run through what the purpose of uh, doing uh, the work is and also go through a timeline. Uh, we have two members, I believe, that have um, identified as being uh, part of the subcommittee to do this work, and we can work with two. If a third is interested, we can certainly um, entertain that. The subcommittee will meet next week. They'll meet the following week, um, and then we'll bring a recommendation um, to the board. So with that, I'm uh, I'm assuming uh, Mr. Merchant is uh, online. Mike, can we hear you? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Great. Glad to be with all of you this evening. Thank you. We have the PowerPoint um, is up on the screen, so we have the the first the first uh, slide is there. So when you're ready for the second slide, let us know. And we'll we'll make that switch. Yes. Yeah, so the committee will begin the process of putting together the tool for the board self assessment and the superintendent's evaluation. And again, you'll see on the slides are the purposes for both of those. And there's great purpose in doing these simultaneously, as as um, Superintendent Hoffman mentioned. And so um, we will go through this task if you'll. Click to the next slide, I'll walk through kind of the timeline and preparation. So as was mentioned, um, we've, we've actually given the board a feedback tool. So we'd love to get the board's feedback um, this week if possible to have you give us some feedback in preparation for prepare, putting together those tools. And so if you'll take that feedback form, complete it and return it to our committee, um, that will be really helpful in the process of preparing for this. Then the committee will actually meet um, the committee meets, uh, as, as was as mentioned earlier, before earlier, they will be meeting the week of July 26th and August 3rd. And they'll meet and put together a draft of both of these tools. We'll bring that draft back to the board for feedback on August 10th. Um, we'll get a chance to review it together, make any adjustments that we need to make to it. And then there'll be a final draft that'll be pushed out to the board for one more review in case there's any additional changes that need to be made prior to approval. Then on the 18th, we'll get together, we'll um, approve that, both of those tools, the self-assessment tool and the um, superintendent evaluation. And then we'll take time on that evening to actually put together the goals, district goals for 2021 and 22, which again will be used for the superintendent's evaluation. And then we'll actually put together the rough draft of a board development plan given the areas in this, the board self-assessment that we might need to want to work, what we might want to work on together over the coming year to prepare us for um, that evaluation, will, which will take place in May of June of 2022. Any questions about the, the timeline, the process? And we'd certainly love to have another, another board member join the committee if at all possible. Mr. Press, do you have any questions, sir? No. Ms. Jamerson? No. Thank you. Dr. Martinez Alir, who's joining me on the committee. Ms. Chair Espinoza, Mr. Forchina. Who are the existing two members that volunteered? <laughs> Myself and Dr. Martinez Alir. Myself and Dr. Martinez Alir. I'll be on the committee. Great. Mr. Yang? No. Nope. All right. So just as a reminder, um, there is the, the, the uh, feedback tool that's um, attached to the agenda. So if uh, board members can, uh, in the next couple of days, take a look through that. And if you could send off um, your comments to uh, President um, Albiani um, and or me, I will make, we'll make sure that uh, the subcommittee has that, uh, that information. Thank you. And if you have any trouble getting to that, um, please contact Ludi and she can help you through that process. Our next item is future board meeting options. And I was incorrect. We do have another public comment, Ms. Soriano, our public comment on future board meeting options. Yes, Madam Board President Albiani, there's only one public comment related to this item. Uh, the public comment is anonymous and it states, I am writing in tonight to ask that this board immediately adopt either option C or option D in this evening's discussion about future board meeting options. 
The need for a presentation tonight from legal counsel instead of simply opening the chamber doors as so many other school districts have already done demonstrates purposeful de delay and a lack of intent to partner with all stakeholders. It is disappointing that such an easy decision to allow pu the public to return to in-person sessions had to find its way onto an agenda and take valuable time away from more pressing district business. If others could pivot back to business as usual, some before June 15th, why are we still stuck in deliberation? Our board meetings are already overly packed with agenda items and often run late into the night. But here we are now looking at the first in-person session in perhaps August. Both options C and D demonstrate collaboration inclusion with all stakeholders, allowing for both in-person and virtual attendance and participation. These options will expand community involvement versus limiting it. The written comment difference with option D also allows for the board to be better prepared with comments provided ahead of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Resendez. Good evening, Board President Albiani, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Avalos, District Leadership. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this topic with you. I'm gonna be addressing the Brown Act and the intersection of the Brown Act with uh, COVID-19 and the safety mitigation measures that were allowed through executive orders during the period of time that we have been um, operating under those executive orders. So context real quick, you probably remember it all too well, but on March uh, 4th, the governor uh, declared a state of an emergency regarding COVID and began issuing executive orders. Those executive orders included um, some flexibility regarding the Brown Act, in particular regarding public comments, which we're gonna talk about right now. Um, uh, prior to this end 2920. Excuse me, yes. can you make that a little shorter and let the microphone be a little closer? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I just want the public to be able to hear you. That's my concern. Okay, no, I appreciate it very much. So. Um, as is reviewed at the beginning of each school board meeting, uh, we've been operating under N2920, which is one of the governor's executive orders pertaining to the Brown Act, which allows school boards to conduct their board meetings in a virtual situation like you're doing uh, via Zoom. It also allowed public comments in, in a remote way, which the school board is also doing. Um, if you go back to the prior step, slide, Mr. May, um, just recently, oh, thank you. Just recently on June 11th, the governor issued another executive order extending N2920 through um, the end of September. So after September 30th, beginning on October 1st, we go back to the Brown Act the way it was in place um, prior to um, these executive orders and the declaration of emergency regarding COVID. Um, so our current status, as you all are very well aware, is on this slide, and um, your board made the decision in March um, after hearing the uh, March 17th executive order to begin on April 21st to have distance uh, board meetings and allow public comments uh, virtually. So that's where we are right now. Um, when you're listening to the rest of this, just keep in mind that by October 1st, unless something changes, and believe me, when it comes to COVID-19 in the state of California, it is likely to change, um, and we need to be flexible and address that situation when it occurs. But as of right now, on October 1st, um, we are required by the Brown Act to go back to the way it was pre-state uh, of emergency order. So we're going to be talking about that, and then the board's going to have some options to consider in terms of how it handles that transition. Um, so I won't go over this full slide regarding how you handle public comments um, through Zoom and also through reading of the board comments submitted online. Um, you just went through that experience and so you're very familiar with it. Um, so this is what you're doing right now. You give the public two options. One is to, um, to present through Zoom and two is to have their public comments read. Uh, this executive order, as I mentioned, um, expires at the end of September and what it requires, and this is the important part that some of you are very familiar with and, and perhaps some of you are not, and that is that uh, prior to the executive order, the Brown Act required that for any 
uh, board member to attend a school board meeting remotely, in other words, from another location other than in the boardroom, those board members would have to do multiple things um, to allow the public access to those board meetings. And so what does access mean? The whole point of the Brown Act is that your business is done openly and transparently um, so that the public can be a participant in observing the business of, of running, in this case, the school district. And so when it goes back to pre-pandemic requirements, what that means is if a board member um, needs for whatever reason to call in or to zoom into a board meeting, that board member's location has to be included in advance on an agenda, the location and posted, the um, location of where they will be attending remotely from will have to also have an agenda posted at that location. The doors will have to be open and members of the public are entitled to attend and make public comments from that remote location. And that location has to be accessible and reasonable accommodations need to be provided to ensure that that location is accessible. So those are some of the requirements um, and the board also needs to be able to hear um, what those public comments are um, from that remote location. So there are a lot of rules that were in place prior to the pandemic that go back into place on October 1st. So that's the most important thing for you to take away from this because that's going to happen absent some change in the law or other executive order. So I went through some of those new requirements um, and when the exceptions end, and now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Mr. Mate to cover some of the options for the board's consideration. And I'll remain here in case there's any questions that you might have regarding the Brown Act or the executive orders. I'll move back up though. Okay, I'm here to talk about some of the options that are available for you when you're dealing with public comments. So obviously there's option A is we can keep everything as they are right now. We can keep everything virtual. We can stay doing exactly what we're doing right now. Um, that will go away. That will not be an option after October 1st, but for right now, we could keep that option going forward. So that's option A. Option B is we could move back fully to the way things were done pre-pandemic. So we'd go full return to in-person board meetings here. Public comments would be live only from here at the lectern in the boardroom. And we'd do blue cards and then uh, we'd submit those and we'd go in, go in the order. And then individuals would be called upon and then there would be no virtual way for doing public comment but the meeting would be streamed live so it'd be just like we were doing before but we'd be streaming it live they'd have to be here at the lectern making public comments so it'd be option b option c is kind of a combination of that where it's a full return to in-person board meetings with live streaming to the public via zoom platform public comments in person in the boardroom or virtually via the zoom platform in-person public comments, we'd use blue cards. They'd be collected and organized by topic and done in, for the in-person public comments. And then Zoom would be done uh, with an online form submitted in advance to help uh, figure out who needs to be requesting to speak during the public comment time. So just like we're doing right now, but we'd be combining in-person and Zoom online, but all uh, voice. Option D is a full return to import. So it's all of C, but all we really did was what was added on was at the bottom of written comments will be collected via the online form one day prior to the meeting and distributed to the board. So there's time to read prior to the meeting. So that way they could still be done on a form prior to that. Now comment on the form and why not read out loud and so on. So when we started to do this in the past, when we first started doing this, we we didn't really know how to handle public comments coming in. The public didn't know how to, even if we knew how to bring the voice, bring voice in at that time, public wouldn't have felt comfortable doing that either, right? They wouldn't have known how to click on, I mean, it's become much more mainstream and people are now okay clicking on, except microphones and doing all of those things. Public comment was designed, what we understand is to be in voice. There's always been an option to be doing email and sending things off in written format, not to be read out loud. So we could add that comment though in there if we want to have a form that's the same form that we use for Zoom, we could collect those, all those and forward them off to you prior to the meeting so you could have them for the topics. So our recommendation though is option C, where it's the full return to in-person board meetings with live streaming to the public via Zoom platform, public comments in person in boardroom or virtually via the Zoom platform, in-person public comments and Zoom public comments. So that's the recommendation from staff for, for public comments. 
with that, we'll answer any questions. All right. Um, usually when we do something like this, if we could go through and you could tell me your thoughts and if you would share your preference of, um, I don't believe anybody's interested in staying in section A. I don't think we need to talk about it. I think we've definitely moved past that. And you can tell me what options you prefer in BCD and um, we'll give everybody a chance to talk, put their input, and then we can look for, um, for a general consensus on guidance from that point. So my paper clip is at Mr. Yang's, I believe. I think I was first earlier. Oh, so whoever next in line. Okay, it's Mr. Perez's turn. Oh my gosh, you guys remind me of my children. So you know what we're gonna do, Mr. Perez, I'd like you to go first, please. All right. Um, staff's recommendations, but that all depends on what's happening in our community. The Delta virus is doubling every week. So, you know, you know we have to, it looks like Sacramento County, Bayer is wearing masks and all these things. So, and uh, that's all I gotta say. We need to maybe maybe make a, uh, a decision. Also, I haven't seen anything. These people that are going to come in this building, are they going to be wearing masks? Are they going to be uh, uh, vaccinated? Are they going to be uh, tested prior to coming in here? Do we know that? What's and, the plan? Oh, sorry. Uh, so those are issues that, I, as me as a board member, and uh, protecting myself and my family. You know, that's what I, the main concerns I have. I have obligations to the community too, the health and safety of our staff. Can you speak to your mic, sir? Okay, our health and safety to our staff, our students. So, so I can I'll, answer those questions for you. Right? Yeah, I think we, we you make answer. a very good point, Mr. Perez. Let Mr. Hoffman give us a better idea of what the whole thing looks like and then your opinion on the public comment part um, what we've heard. So, right. Thank you. Okay. So we, thank you so for bringing that up. I'm finished. Well, then I'll come back to you. <laughs> so, Mr. Perez, did you want to hear the responses? What? Did you want to hear? I said, then I'd come right back to you. Okay. Well, I'll wait. I'll wait till the end. I can answer those questions. They'll probably be good for everybody. I said I'd go right back. Okay. Ms. Jamerson, do you have anything to add? I think that that actually is a great question like what does it look like so so the idea will be um this is a classroom uh with regards to we had students here tonight when we open up we will likely have students um in the chambers and so we should treat this room uh, like a classroom and um and that requirement is that we have uh masks kids are masked wear masks uh, we're not doing, we'll, we'll spread folks out as much as we can. I mean, we, whenever spacing is available, we want to, we want to take advantage of that. It's not a requirement, but it is, uh, it's the right thing to do. Uh, so as we have um, the, the public meetings here, we would ask that people um, are masked. The, uh, I'll have, actually, I sent a letter to you this afternoon that came from Dr. Kassiri, um, the state or the, the county public health official. And her recommendation is anytime you're in a public space, um, and you're indoors, the recommendation, the strong recommendation is that, um, that people wear masks. And that's uh, speaking to Mr. Perez's uh, talk about the, uh, the increase in the, uh, in the virus um, across the Sacramento County area. It has increased dramatically um, over the past, uh, past few weeks. And if we were back in the old tiers, it would be purple. I mean, it's not, I mean, that, that's just, that is, that is the reality of what's going on right now. And according to Dr. Kassiri, according to CDC, according to CDPH, the uh, masks allow us to be closer together. And so if we have folks in this room, um, if we're masked, that's, that's safer for uh, folks when we don't know who's vaccinated and who's not. And so the mask would be, uh, would be our recommend, strong recommendation. 
And will this be open and we will have more space or are uh, there we'll, have both, we'll have both rooms open um, because we, we had staff from um, finance department that was using that. They're no longer using that. So we'll be able to open up the room like we, like we normally do. Um, we do believe we'll have people that show up, uh, but we also think that we will have um, um, people continue to uh, view us through Zoom because it's just a whole lot more convenient to do that in my recliner um, than it is to come and join us in our comfortable chairs that we have um, here. So I think that will uh, that will continue to uh, to be the case. Mr. Prez, did you have more to say, sir? Yes, like those are the issues that you know you need to be knowledgeable about what's happening in our community. You know, the COVID Delta variant is exploding and people are not adhering to being vaccinated. They're not adhering to be going out there and get tested. And, 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 and there's, a sec there's a certain populace within our communities throughout the nation that they don't believe in science, bottom yeah. line. So, so you're, you're correct, Mr. Perez, because one of the pieces we need to do is you're going to give us direction tonight and we're going to move forward for the August 10th meeting. Yeah. But the reality is we're going to have to be flexible because uh, we don't know what's going to, but this is, this is our, the best decision we're making tonight based on the information we have in front of us. But as we move forward, we may come back with a different recommendation right. uh, based on what the health conditions are. But the recommendation that we have tonight, we think is safe. And we think it actually increases the opportunity for the public to engage with us. And so it, so it checks right. two very important boxes. Yeah, like, like I said, uh, uh, I agree with staff's recommendation, options, option C, full return in person. That's, that's my objective. I want to be uh, with the people, with the, our, with the community, to give input in person. But yet, you know, what I see in our community, that's all. I'm, and I want to make make sure that if somebody comes to this door, that they wear a mask. You know, if they come through this door, hopefully they have been vaccinated. But I, you know, that's their civil rights, and also tested. So you know, those are concerns that I want to stress to my fellow board members in the community. If you want to come to this board meeting and exercise your uh, civil rights or your civic engagement, more power to you. I want you here. That's all I gotta say. Thank you, Ms. Jamerson. So I believe the question is in terms of the options that we're considering. And so um, options C and D are the two that I'm uh, most interested in. I understand though in option D, the written comments that that takes time to be able to process those, redistribute them out to the board um so my kind of um i guess amendment to option c would be to ensure that the public is aware that they can email their board members at any time that way it doesn't put undue work on Ms. soriano to collect that and redistribute it but to make sure that we do offer that option for the public to or, or just make them aware that they have that option to email the board with their own public comments. Thank you. Dr. martinez Salir. For me, um, it's option C. Um, again, I think looking at close neighboring districts, many of them are functioning back with the in-person. I don't know if they're necessarily offering that live in Zoom. So I think that's um, a nice feature to be able to still have people call in if needed to voice their public comments or concerns. Um, also, just a point for clarification. I know prior to this, we didn't have written comment so my question is, when the executive order expires, then so will the written comment. I just wanted to confirm that with you. Legally, will that be the case? There's no legal requirement that would be reinstated that would mandate written comment. Okay, so that's- And certainly um, have written comments, and that doesn't mean that the public hasn't previously communicated in writing in different ways to the board. Right, by email. So, okay, thank you. I just wanted that clarification just because that's the return to the way things were done prior previously um, to the pandemic. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chair Espinoza. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I am, bless you, I am um, looking at option C and D. I think I like option C the most, but I am now a little confused about that last bullet in option D. My understanding is that we did have pre-pandemic a process for written comment. Um, so it seems to me that adding this last bullet in option D is kind of duplicative and potentially more confusing for the public. We didn't have uh, the technically a uh, written public comment. It was just that at any point, um, members of the public can contact uh, the board um, individually or uh, send a communication to the entire board. So, but it wasn't, right. it wasn't a piece that was, that was part of uh, public. Account. We would get, board members would get an email the afternoon of a board meeting and there would be information that they could consider uh, when they were um, in the meeting that night, uh, but it wasn't quote unquote considered public comment. Right. Um, and it's either way, right? Pre-pandemic and under option D, they wouldn't be, written comments wouldn't be read during the meeting. Correct. That is the same. Okay. In that case, my preference is definitely option C. It's just more streamlined, I think, easier for the public to understand. Thank you, Mr. Forcina. I agree with, uh, with Nancy in terms of C being more uh, streamlined. Um, and also with option D, what the last bullet does is, is, is just provide one additional opportunity for the public to, uh, to provide input. I think that uh, if there's uh, any benefits from what we have just gone through, uh, it opened the door for more people to be able to participate because it is often difficult for people to come here during the board meeting. Um, if, if written comments were collected via online, what, what this says is that they would just be given to the board for the board to read before our time. Correct. Well, that's that's the idea. Of the The idea of public comment is that you you hear that information um, prior to a decision being made. So that, that was that or or a topic that's not on the agenda is brought to your attention. We would still do our. You know, we would still follow up. We we're still going to do a follow up to public comment uh, like we're doing currently um, to give the board what staff's going to do as a result. But we wouldn't be doing that ahead of. Uh, the board meeting happening right but but the public would not be privy to those public comments correct because they because we wouldn't be reading them aloud during the meeting and 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 that's what i'm uncomfortable with it just mm -hmm. it 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 takes away uh an opportunity for people to have their input heard by by not it reading the comments and i i guess i i guess where where i just have a, a, again additional problem um I, I don't foresee a time when we given given that we're going to have an open board meeting and given that we have zoom where we would be deluged with a bunch of written comments i i, I have to kind of believe they'd be few in number so you know maybe we test it for a while you know uh, uh see what that looks like I, I i i can live with option c it's it's just that i guess um i don't like closing the door to all the opportunities. And if I can go back and, and just ask a couple more questions, not on this, uh, but in terms of our open board meetings, um, will the seating be as it was prior to our meetings being closed? As far as the board, where the board is? And all seating. So we're we're working through the layout the way the way we think we will 
do this is have because one of the things we also have to consider is we're going to have to make a modification for a student board member Correct. going forward. So we have kind of a temporary piece, and then we're going to have a longer term piece because we need to redesign this whole room and update it because it's not really, uh, as we found out, this is hard to do in this room. Well, everything uh, about this room is right. wrong. So so the, the initial piece, I think, would be is we'd get the, the board, the seven board members, back behind the dais uh, without uh, Ms. Avalos and I up there. So you have a little bit more elbow room, uh, but you're at the dais. Uh, Ms. Avalos and I would be where uh, Mr. Yang and Mr. Porcina are um, for now, which would free this, this space up so we can get back into being able to do uh, photos and some of the other things that we do when we have, have it in public. So that would be our temporary uh, fix. And then we'll, we're gonna work through a longer term fix of, of redesigning um, the setup so that it, that it's more functional and then we don't have a timeline on it, but, um, you know, the, uh, the board, um, architect committee, you know, we would, we would give them the opportunity to be part of that process as we, um, as we work through this, but the short-term solution is, um, Ms. Avalos and I move where, where you and Mr. Yang are, we slide you back into, uh, the dais, a little more room than you had, uh, with previously. the student representative, the student rep, we haven't, finalize that yet because that'll be for September so the initial the initial piece is um, that first move and we're going to work through a solution for uh, for the student rep and I give my seat up for the student rep and sit right where I sit so we'll, we'll figure it out we'll get them we'll get them well placed um, with respect to the public is is their seating going to be as it was prior to Last we April. will. We're going to spread them out a little. We'll right, give them, you know, uh, three feet of, of space. If we get to a phase where we have uh, more people and we need to have um, less space, then we'll then we'll put more chairs out and use less space. So I think it'll kind of depend on um, how popular the meetings are. But if we can have space, we're going to want to use space. So we'll so we'll maximize um, the use of the room as much as we can, and we'll have to make adjustments based on uh, the number of people that uh, that are here. Okay, many, many times, all seating is utilized and there, and there's a standing room only throughout the room. Will we continue to allow that? Well, we, well, we do have the limitations based on fire marshal. So I understand, but I'm talking about all the meetings we've had that I've attended for the last eight years. There've been many times when people are standing all the way around the entire room. One of the things we'll do, um, and a lot of times that's at the beginning of the meeting when we're doing um, student recognitions. Correct. So we'll probably hold off on, it's the beginning of the year, so there aren't as many to do, so the beginning of the year, that's usually a little bit, so what we'll probably do, and we've done this in some cases, is we'll probably queue groups um, within uh, the building if we know we have um, particularly large groups that are going to come through. So we'll, again, where we can space and use spacing, uh, we're going to want to take advantage of that. But the reality is there's going to be times where we'll be, where we'll be tight in here. And that's why masking is going to be really important. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Yang. Thank you for the presentation. Quick question first. In the past, the uh, pre uh, pandemic, um, do we have Zoom platform available? No, not we did not have it pre-pandemic. Okay. So given the fact that the student's going to resume to the classroom like it was, and it sounds like the only thing that's going to be different is they're going to wear masks, right? That's my understanding. So with that said, I think that I like option C with modification of public comment has to be in person and then provide Zoom for the meeting. I think that's it's justifiable for the whole school district per se of what the students doing, the, the teachers, the staff. And I think we should do the same thing here in the board uh, meeting room. So if people want to make comments, they have to come in attending the board meeting. Is that option B? 
Well, that, that would be option option, option C minus. C right? minus. <laughs> All right. Is it B? I think it's B. It might be B. No virtual public ads. B. Yeah. It's B. You prefer B? Meeting is streamed live. Yes. Thank so you. No virtual option for public comment, but the meeting is streamed live. And that'd be streamed live would be via Zoom. Okay. Or a different platform. If we don't have to bring in live chat, we don't have to use Zoom. We could use YouTube or some other streaming service. Okay. And and the reason why. I like that option is because of what's going on with the students in the classroom. And I, so that, that's my option. Okay. Um, I am also in support of the staff recommendation of option C. Um, if it's the will of the board, I can go down and we can do another vote. I could tell you the numbers basically feed out to a one, five, one being B, C, D. Um, did anybody want to, are we still good with that and give that direction for option C? Okay. okay. So we am, would like am, to move ahead with I, option. Beth, am I the, you said it's one, five, one. Am I the, am I one of the ones? Yeah, you're you're on option. You would prefer option D, but you will accept option I'm, C. I'm okay so I put you down as D. Okay, I'm, in the vote. I'm okay with C. Okay. Okay. Then we're going ahead with that. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for your time and Keep consideration caring. and Thank your you, thoughtful Steve. comments. Our next item is an adjustment to school facility fees or developer fees. Ms. Soriano, are there any public comments related to this item? Madam Board President Albany, there are no public comments related to this. Thank item. you, Mr. Pierce. You're back. Thank you, President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoff and Ms. Avalos. These next two items are actually annual and somewhat routine for the board, so I'll be brief. Uh, the, the item before you tonight is an annual item adopted by your board, um, valid for only one year. The last time you took this action was September 15th of 2020. Therefore, your current level two fee for new residential development will expire on September 14th. Um, so we have prepared a new school facility needs analysis. It's been put out for public comment and public review. Um, all noticing has been conducted as required by law. And we also have a process in place where any requesting third party also re receives um, the study. And then we have a routine item where we also share it directly with the North State Building Industry Association, as well as all cities and the County of Sacramento in our jurisdiction. Um, as I mentioned, these fees are referred to as level two fees. They must be justified through a school facility needs analysis in accordance with government code um, and other statutory provisions. Um, these are based on formulas, again, stipulated in law. And in concept, um, it is an amount equivalent to what the state says is 50% of the cost to build a school. Um, under the intent of the model, the remaining 50% is provided through the state school facility program. Um, this calculation contained in the June 2021 SFNA proposes a level two fee of $6.72 per square foot of new residential development. Um, this represents an increase of 38 cents from your existing fee, um, which is just below 6% um, in terms of the increase. Um, it's due to the, in the large increase to site acquisition costs, so otherwise property that we have to purchase in order to build a school as well as a slight increase in the state construction cost allowance for schools. So public comments open, um, it will close on August 10th, where you will also open and close a public hearing on this matter. And at that time, we will ask you to consider adopting a resolution justifying the new fee of $6.72. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Seeing none. Oh, not a question, a suggestion. Sure. <laughs> on your uh, presentation uh, on future schools facilities as of 2021, uh -huh. uh, we have the ability to map out these particular uh, elementary schools, high schools, and other projects. And it'd be nice if you put those on an actual map for us. Within the study itself? Uh huh. Thank you. I like that. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Other than that, very good. Excellent report. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So 
We will have this item brought back to the board on August 10th, 2021 and a regular board meeting for public hearing and adoption. Thank Our you. next item is this, um, the Elk Grove Unified School District Community Facility Districts 2021-2022 tax report and first reading of ordinance number one, 2021-2022. Ms. Soriano, are there any public comments related to this item? Madam Board President, I'll leave there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Thank you again, an annual item. Uh, this is unique for the board because it's the only ordinance that you adopt each year. Um, this sets the tax rate for each property in community facility district number one. And in this case for the 2021-2022 school year, uh, the ordinance includes the adoption of the annual tax report and the establishment of the tax rates in CFD number one. I do wanna note for the board that when you look at the report, you'll see that revenues are up 3.1% and all the other categories in the tax report are up except for one. Um, but I will say this is really positive news. It's the second year in a row where you've seen growth in CFD number one, um, and that actually follows two years of a decline. So that's a good indication of what's happening in the housing market and the planning market. Um, so just um, positive uh, moving forward and nice to see uh, people getting entitlements and moving projects. So this will be back before the board um, for approval no later than August 10th and will be delivered to the Sacramento County Auditor's Office no later than August 13th. Um, this does, I believe, includes a public hearing. Um, so you can open and close that. And again, we'll be back on August 10th. And I could be off on my notes, Madam Chair. Um, so, Do I need to have a public hearing? I don't have that. No, it'll be a public hearing on August. On 10th. August tenth will be the public hearing. I apologize for that. Yes. Okay, but um, it, and there was no public comment. And um, Mr. Prez, I heard you. Did you have a comment? Yeah. Um, the same report that uh, Judge Davis fired on the other year. Is your mic on, sir? <laughs> uh, is this the same report where you had? Um, what do you call it, uh, those properties that del delinquent? Thank you, yes. So what happens as a result of this, um, once the county reports back to us, uh -huh. um, the properties that did not pay their taxes, uh -huh. depending on the value of those delinquencies, if they're above $25,000 or more, uh -huh. we bring a report back to you where you take action to foreclose and place a lien on those properties. Uh -huh. It is fairly rare. It tends to only happen in a recession or other times. Right. Um, but we have had a couple um, that have been fairly routine. One of those have had a recent property ownership change. Um, they quickly rectified that, paid all their previous delinquencies, and they paid their taxes for last year. Um, we suspect there will be one more, um, which is a routine customer, if you will. But this is a separate item. So this okay. just establishes the tax rate for the 21-22 tax year. Yeah. And uh, I see the seniors also have reductions. <laughs> we're, uh, we're unique in that regard in our district that we provide seniors with a 60% reduction on their tax bill. Yeah, we need more publicity that we do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you this building gets really active when we open the doors for seniors to um, uh -huh. enact that waiver. Um, they love to do it in person. We ought to have them volunteer more, though. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Uh, all right. Thank you. This uh, now this item will be brought back to the board on August tenth, two thousand twenty-one, at a regular board meeting for adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Our next item, number five, American Recovery Plan Act, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. ESSER three grant plan. Ms. Soriano, are there any public comments related to this item? Madam Board President, I'll be any, there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. I'm not wearing my call shoes today. I feel really, really good. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. Tonight, um, we're gonna bring you some information that is very, very new um, and unexpected. So as part of some requirements for us to expend funds, there were some requirements of us to develop some plans, which you guys have taken action on, two of them previously, and now we have another one that we're bringing to you. 
So I'm doing double duty. I'm actually gonna speak a little bit on behalf of instruction and my friend, Mr. Saruti and Mr. Pierce are going to uh, chime in if they need to. So we've seen this graphic many, many, many times. So our work is all grounded in E4. And these are the four different strategic goals that we use. And we'll be using the same process and the same lenses as we go through developing this plan. Tonight, we're gonna take a um, look at some of the background information of how we got here, the different plan requirements, authorized uses, and then um, the detailed timeline. And then we do have, um, we're gonna ask for your discussion and feedback on priorities that we've notated from the different, um, different things that we've talked about over time from the board's perspective. So outside of board priorities, these were additional items that the board has mentioned wanting to fund. So some of the background information, um, our district is scheduled to receive approximately $308 million in COVID relief funding. The funding originates from both federal and state levels. And to access the funds, the district must develop a plan that addresses students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs, as well as any opportunity gaps that existed before and were worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. What we're gonna see here is a lot of different um, strings that are now attached to the ESSER three funds that we didn't see in ESSER one or two. So it's been tricky. The Board of Education has approved the following plans. We had the LCP, which we had to account for $57 million. That was out of the round one monies and it mostly came from federal, there was a little bit of state. Then on June 1st, the board approved the expanded learning and opportunities plan. That was $40 million with 36 million um, going direct services to students and the other 4 million was for paraprofessionals. That 40 million um, is coming from AB 86. So it's 100% state funds, not federal. And then beginning of the fall of 2020, the district had started soliciting stakeholder input because of these plans. And we got input from students, families, staff, bargaining unit leaders, the Board of Education, and we generated a list of over 500 items. So looking at the plan requirements, we have to do meaningful consultation with the following groups. And these are not new groups to us. These are the same groups that we engage in when we build our LCAP annually. Um, so this was not new for us and this was work that had already started. So we were in pretty good shape when we found out that um, the writing of this plan is very similar to the LCAP. There's prompts that the district has to respond to, um, a description of the efforts made by the district for meaningful consultation, and a description of how the development of the plan was influenced by community input. That one is a little bit different as far as how we have to describe what the reach out was, what input we received back. And so when we say community input, um, it's our normal community input, but it's also those community partners that we may be working with that are outside of Elk Grove Unified. Um, it could be advocate groups, it could be all kinds of different groups of people. The planned action services have to supplement the actions and services already included in the district's plans. What they're referring to here is they want you to supplement what's in your existing district LCAP, potentially your ELO plan that we've signed or approved, excuse me, and then the LCP. So we continue to see them blending all of our plans together. Um, the area specific, there's three specific areas which you'll see in the plan that we'll be um, providing actions and services to. And it's strat the first one is strategies for continuous and safe in-person learning, it's specific to the prevention and mitigation strategies that are to the greatest extent that should say, oh yeah, practical, in line with the most CDC guidance. And so we do that as a matter of course, anyway, we're in constant um, contact with uh, County Public Health and then the CDC. So we do that already. The second item we have to do is addressing the impact of lost instructional time. It quotes to address the academic impact of lost instructional time through the implementation of evidence-based interventions, such as summer learning or summer enrichment, extended day, comprehensive after-school programs or extended school year programs. So this component is literally time. It's gotta be time outside of the normal instructional day. 
It can be during the summer, it can be before school, it can be after school, but it has to be some extension of time in order to, um, to do this. And right now um, for item number two, uh, a good example of this is our expanded learning opportunities programs that we're running at our school sites right now. This is the one that I don't like, but all of my other colleagues like, and it's the use of any remaining funds but it's specific to implement additional actions to address students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs, as well as to address opportunity gaps. So that's important because you're gonna, we're gonna go through some of the regs that they talk about, and there's some open-ended statements that can be construed like this one, use of any remaining funds, that it may sound like it, it's just open-ended, you can use the money for whatever you want, and that's just not the case. So authorized uses, these are directly from Ed Code as far as what we can use the ESSER 3 funds for. 20% has to be related for expenditures addressing academic impact of lost instructions. We just talked about that. And then here again, we, it says any activity authorized by Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, IDEA, Adult Ed, Family Literacy Act, and then the Carl Perkins Career and Technical Education Act. I want to be clear about this act that it is the um, that act is what governs all of the federal funds. So it's coming from U.S. Department of Ed. It's not coming from the California Department of Ed. So if you go through this um, particular act, it is very centered on increasing academic achievement. It's not geared toward um, administration in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's attached the SEL pieces but it's not um, completely discretionary. So all that sounds really good in that second bullet, but there are definite um, structure to it. Then we have coordination of preparedness and response efforts. This particular item has been a, um, an ongoing theme through all of the monies we've seen thus far. The intention here is to make sure that if we go into another pandemic that we're prepared. So they wanna make sure that we have processes in place and these funds can go towards that. Then we have activities to address the unique needs of low-income students, students with disabilities, English learners, racial and ethnic minorities, homeless students, and foster youth, including how to outreach and service delivery will meet the needs of each population. Here we've seen um, same kind of theme going through all of the federal funds for COVID, which is the um, need for wraparound services for our students. So not just necessarily from an academic standpoint, but whatever they need in order to remove those barriers that they can get to school and they can um, learn. Additional uses is developing and implementing procedures and systems to improve preparedness. Training and professional development. I know everybody gets excited when they see professional development, but this is specific to training staff on sanitation and minimizing the spread of infectious disease. Purchasing supplies and sanitation and cleanup facilities. We've heard that off and on. Planning for coordinating and implementing activities during long-term closures. And so that was related directly to distance learning. So if we had to shut down schools again, do we have processes in place and do you need funding to um, make that happen? That would also include providing technology for online learning for all students, providing guidance for carrying out requirements under IDEA. So our children that have IEPs to ensure that those services are delivered. And then any other educational services continue to be provided with all state, federal and local requirements. More uses, the purchasing of education technology, including hardware, software, and connectivity. Um, providing mental health services and supports. We've seen a lot of that as well. And then planning and implementing activities related to summer learning, after school programs and providing classroom instruction or online learning during the summer months, which is what we're doing right now with the ELO funds. I know this is a long list, so I'm sorry, bear with me. Administering and using high quality assessments that are valid and reliable. That was another big push that um, we didn't see when ESSER 1 was rolled out. Um, we saw a little bit of this at ESSER 2, but driving home that we really know what the children need and not just doing what we think they need. So the assessment became really important. Implementing evidence-based activities. You'll hear Mr. Ceruti and his team, they talk about evidence-based activities all the time and a comprehensive needs of students. Providing information and assistance to parents and families and then tracking student attendance and improving student engagement in distance education. That one is interesting for me because we really struggled with how to document um, 
distance learning. Although we're all back now, um, this is probably isn't as important, but it would have been nice to know that we could have used that many um, previously. So the plan development timeline, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about this. Um, we spent a lot of time backward mapping. So when ESSER 3 came out, we had, I think it was the beginning of June, we had until June 25th to submit assurances to CDE. What that meant was we had to go through the assurances and make sure that we are compliant with federal law. So there's a number of different um, things that we have to make sure happen. So from the compliance um, side, that's stuff I'm doing in the background that people don't necessarily need to be involved in. Um, when that happened, that trigger happened is when we found out that we needed this plan. And the criteria at that time was that we had to have a board approved plan by the end of September. So we had already um, planned out our timeline um, and we are sticking with this timeline, although CDE has revised the date in which it has to be approved by the board to October, which makes more sense because many districts don't aren't in session during the summer. So um, we thought we could still try this plan um, as far as the timeline is concerned. And I, I don't think it's too aggressive. I think we're in pretty good shape. And um, so assurances were submitted to CDE. And then tonight we're here to go over the schedule, the timeline, the process and get your input and feedback. Then uh, July 21st, which I believe is a Wednesday. And then the following week of July 28th, um, the stakeholder consultation planning is to allow LSLT to do their work so that when we reach out to our community partners, we have a plan in place. Um, some of it's gonna be done via a, a survey so we can collect the information, but there's gonna be different uh, ways that we reach out and that we make contact, we might meet you know, via Zoom or in person. So those plans are gonna be developed on those two Wednesdays. And then as another requirement of ESSER 3, 30 days after we submit our assurances, we have to post a safe return to in-person instruction plan. So we already have that plan. And according to the regulations, we can continue to use that plan, but it had to be reviewed to make sure that it had certain components that the CDC wanted to see. This plan then has to be posted on our website by July 23rd. And then every six months thereafter, the plan has to be updated if the CDC guidance changes. We also have to solicit um, community feedback into that return plan. Then we're anticipating August 2nd through August 13th to have detailed stakeholder consultation meetings with our different stakeholders within Elk Grove. And then on August 10th is a normal regular scheduled board meeting. At that time, if the board desires to have an update or to provide additional feedback, we could do that at, on August 10th. It's currently not scheduled, but we could do that if the board wishes. And then on August 16th, research and evaluation is gonna go through all the data that's been collected and align it um, with our actions and services and the different parts of the plan. And then at the board workshop on August 18th, we plan to engage the board in a more detailed conversation of what the plan is starting to look like and evolve into. And at that time, we would expect that the board um, provide additional input and feedback. On August 23rd, the intention is to have a draft plan that's in alignment with all of our stakeholder input. And then we would like to provide to the board through a board communication, the update of our draft plan. And starting August 30th through September 3rd, we would like to hold a public comment window on the actual draft plan. The intention is to post the plan on our website and allow the public to provide feedback. Then on September 7th, we would like to hold a public hearing on the actual plan itself and then bring it back to you on September 21st to be adopted. We have September 29th as a potential board meeting in the event something is to go south and we're not able to adhere to all of the little bits and parts that we need to put together for the plan. And then ultimately it needs to be submitted to our county office of education. Like I said, September 30th was the original due date to our county office. It's been extended to October, but um, conversation with administration and cabinet, we decided that we wanna stick to this plan because there's a whole nother plan that you're gonna be asked to review and provide input in due to um, changes in the state's budget. So the initial board feedback that we heard and we took notes on, um, these are the different themes, if you will. 
couple of things that I wanted to just point out. The ASB budget augmentation, the board approved on June 22nd, I think the amount was $250,000, both for elementary and secondary to, to do the welcoming of students and, and to offset the cost that their ASBs may be incurring since they, there was no way for ASBs to do any fundraising for the last school year. The expansion of equity and restorative practices, this includes also the safe spaces or welcoming centers, also includes um, cultural competence, bias training, development of targeted programs for targeted student groups. Um, and we talked about the safe centers and the welcoming centers. So that actually we have taken a little bit um, and we have done a little bit in that area. So on um, June 22nd, the board also approved some, I think it was $7 million to of round one funding to support some different areas that we thought were a priority. One of those was education equity. And we actually um, are advertising right now, I believe it's three positions. Then we had expansion of services provided by Family and Community Engagement Office. We had mental health supports. Again, the board did take action to approve to continue funding social workers, which falls in line with mental health supports, social emotional learning supports. Professional development, the board did take action on May 18th to approve ongoing 1.3 million in the area of professional development. However, we know that there was an interest on behalf of the board to finish out Arbinger training and to, to uh, provide some additional trainings. Um, so that is still in the works, obviously. And then expansion of visual and performing arts and then virtual academies. And with that, I'm gonna pause here and open it up for board discussion on the different items as well as the timeline and any questions you may have regarding the timeline in the process. Yeah, just, okay. a, just a real quick piece to make sure, you know, between the list of 500 that we provided that, that captured everybody's ideas, these are the additional ideas that we heard from the board over the past several weeks that we, we tried to capture. So tonight, really, we just wanna make sure if there's something that you've been thinking about that we didn't capture, we wanna make sure we get it captured tonight. Um, and if there's another idea that you have that, that you haven't shared yet, all we're trying to do right now is make sure the list is complete for the start of the work. Um, it's not a, it's not really said to be a debate about which items are more important than the other. We just want to make sure our list to start the work um, is complete. Thank you. I think um, Mr. Hoffman made it very clear. Uh, he just wants to make sure he has all the information so he can go forward. And I do have a list. Um, Ms. Ludi has given me a, a list here. I'm going to follow. Mr. Forchina, do you have any questions or comments or things to add to the list? Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, by way of comment, um, I think every, everyone that knows me knows I'm in, not into hand holding. I believe in personal responsibility. Uh, that being said, however, in the uh, in the spirit of uh, ensuring that our community has an opportunity to provide input, to me, uh, bullet number three kind of falls short of the mark of ensuring that everyone is knowledgeable that, that we have a plan and the, and the plan is located somewhere. Because what, what that says is that to me is that in, unless you go to the district's website, you are not gonna be aware that there's a plan. So uh, we know that uh, many parents don't go to the district website. Therefore, we are going to eliminate uh, the opportunity on behalf of many, many parents to review the plan. So sure. Christina, we'll, we'll, we'll do a full blast on it. You're going to do the email blast, yeah, the and full the text. blast with, with links, but we, but in the end, we have to have a place where it's housed. Okay. And so the website's where it's going to be housed, but we will provide plenty of opportunities for people to, to get to that. They're not going to have to 
only if they happen to be cruising the website is when they would come across it. Right. Uh, we will, we'll do a full, our normal full blast as far as the information goes. Oh, okay. I did. I didn't see that there. So I was concerned that that was kind of limiting <laughs> the sec the second thing in terms of the data that was uh, provided, uh, uh, to to everyone, I suppose, and, and I'm not nitpicking. I'm I, I'm just curious. The 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 list says that it's not in particular order, but items, and and that holds true for items one to twenty, but for items twenty one to four hundred and five, they are alphabetical. So why did why was that there for a particular reason? I'm not looking at the list out of the top. Are those the board? Do we put the board items up front just so they're easy to find? Okay. Right. Now, Mr. Fortuna, the list of 500, you are correct. The first, however many on this list, are um, in random order. Then the middle, middle section is alphabetical. And then at the end, as we've been getting more stuff coming in, we've just put it on the bottom. Yeah. So that's why we said there's no particular order. We did not want the public, nor did we want the board to think that administration went through and prioritized these because we did not. Okay. Um, then the, the two things that, and, and I looked, and, 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 they, and they certainly could be here, uh, and I missed them, uh, but, but uh, two points that are not high dollar issues but have big impact was one, uh, the purchase of, of books. And we, we talked about that, that uh, the librarians have, have been putting together, Office of Equity has been putting together uh, our Native American uh, education program has been putting together and, and I just want to ensure that that is, is there for our discussion is the purchase of, of books. May I clarify, are you referring to textbooks as far as curriculum or library? Library books by by authors of different ethnicities. Yeah, it's on one of the lists for sure. Yeah, I, I, sure it's I, out, but it's 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 there. It's there. Yep. And the, then the second thing, um, again, which has uh, an impact on students, especially uh, foster and homeless, uh, was the creation and addition to the, the closed closets. And, I, and again, I didn't see it. Um, I don't know if that's on there specifically, but we do have a whole section um, from homeless of what their needs are. Um, I don't have that list on the top of my head and I honestly did not put the 500 to memory. That, that, is, that is something that our schools use on a regular basis, the, the clothing for kids. And uh, and it's and it's limited because they they um, rely on donations and their minuscule site budgets that they get from our district. So I can tell you for the homeless population as part of the COVID nineteen relief funds specific to SR three, um, based on our number of homeless students, we received four hundred and sixty thousand dollars. That's just for them. Um, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't get something above and beyond that, but there was a commitment to our homeless population that they would be supported. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jamerson. Followed by Dr. Martina Salir. Um, I just had one quick question on the um, slide with uh, the initial board feedback. Uh, the third bullet, or I'm sorry, the second bullet expansion of equity and restorative practices. You mentioned professional development was in that category, um, bias training and such. And then we also have professional development uh, further down on the list. So is that more professional development in terms of teaching strategies, curriculum? I just kind of wanting to know the difference of where those are at and why are those are prioritized, like not prioritized, but why are those placed in different areas? 
So from our perspective, there's professional development probably in all those different bullets. There's professional development for our practitioners, there's professional development for teaching staff, and then there was professional development that we heard that the board said that they were interested in. Okay. So for me, the professional development, just the general bullet, the third one from the bottom, that would just be for general professional development for the where the district needs. So if that's bias training for all, you know, whatever that is and what that looks like, that hasn't been necessarily developed yet. We would love to have the board's input and feedback on what general professional development would look like, but definitely in um, equity and restorative practices, there was a, a specific item in there for bias training and some other training. So I would say some of them have flavors. What we're going to do is um, when we meet together with LSLT, we're going to take the, all of the components and uh, all the PD then will be together in one spot and then we'll know what all of it is. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure that the equity centered professional development doesn't kind of get lost. No, it in does the not. Up. It's actually called out. We have it um, professional development in EL, there's professional development in equity, and there was professional development in one of the other CPL. Okay. So yeah, so it's, we know, we know about all of it and we're just trying to make sure that everything is, when we say professional learning, just like you've asked, it's all there and we can call out the different components. Okay, thank you. And I have no further questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Martinez Alir, followed by Mr. Perez. From what I see on the list, it encompasses a, a lot of information, all the 500 items. Um, and so just kind of reintegrating, I know there's some things that uh, position wise were added to the list too, um, like expansion of certain like paraeducators and things of that nature. So I guess as we compile more of the stakeholder feedback and you come back to us, we'll be able to see exactly some of the needs, right? When we're looking at certain like positions as far as like mental health or things of that nature too. Yeah, right now what we're going through is we're looking at the 500 list. Some of it's already been picked up in different plans. Um, the other part of it is making sure that the funding source can actually do that action and service. So right now we're going through all of those different ideas to see, okay, yes, this is one that we can do. And yes, it's allowable in the funding source, but yeah, there's definitely positions in there to implement. Um, that is tricky. I think it's making our HR department a little uncomfortable because one time money means that people go away. So our hope is to um, provide services over a three-year period. These funds expire in uh, June of 24. And then hopefully by that time, um, there's different um, legislation that's going through that hopefully that districts will get more money and we won't have to terminate services. That's the hope. So when you come back to us, we'll be able to see exactly where different funds have maybe been applied and that way we can know and and hopefully that list will be a little bit more condensed. <laughs> I'm yes, thinking if certain funds condensed. were used for, you know, so some of these. We'll make it more useful, we promise. <laughs> right, we just thanks. wanted to make sure everybody saw that the whole list is there. That, that, that's one thing that was our initial piece, but yeah, it, it's it's not usable as it is. There's lots of duplications. And, and so we're, we're doing that work now to make it more usable. We just wanted to be transparent that all the information was there. Thank you, that's all my questions. Thank you, Mr. Perez to be followed by Mr. Yang. So I'm not sure, was this a multi-year uh, project or just one year? The ESSER three funds we have now, they actually go back in time to March of 20. And we have until June 30th of 2024 to have everything expensed. Okay, yeah, this is, this is the pot of money that goes three years around there, right? Four. Okay, uh, administrative costs, is that included? I didn't see it. <laughs> so yes, there's a component. Um, if you guys are familiar with indirect, that is the cost of doing business. It's what funds my operations and everything. So yes, there is, we are allowed to charge indirect to these funds. How much, what percent? 4.26% for this year. Hmm. Not very much. <laughs> no, it's not. But that's we're, a good thing. People will tell you. What are you going to do? <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> no, um, I thought I saw uh, someplace that we were going to hire somebody to do some of this work, or was that a word I see that? I'm not another, sure. Maybe it was in another program. Mm -mm. 
we have outside providers that are um, running programs. Uh, that are schools, uh, I but... think I saw something. Maybe it was another program within the report. Something, another report. Um, coordination and preparedness for another event, mm -hmm. catastrophe. I think that's very priority number one to me right now is uh, and to have that system in place because they're already talking about the next one. I can't believe it <laughs> in my lifetime. So uh, yes, that is number one priority. Um, coordination preparedness and they're having that system in place. And also developing and implementing procedures and systems for to repair, I guess that, that goes in two, I think those two. And assessments, uh, uh, data. Well, how much is there, is there in this particular pot of money? Data, outcomes, do outcome data sets. Uh, so we have data that RED is compiling. Right. Um, the assessment pieces, we've already purchased some of those, which is Illuminate, I think you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. So we could use this pot of money for that also? Yeah, we already used round one to purchase Illuminate. Okay. And also tracking students attendance that's in place. Uh, and you mentioned with uh, uh, that 18th, no, 818th, we're gonna have that workshop, right? Yes. And, yeah, that's very important. Put mm -hmm. that on your calendar, fellow board members. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is an important point, um, Mr. Perez, is one of the things that we're going to want to do first with this, um, this round three piece is take a look at our ELO plan um, and take a look at the LCP plan because those, those had finite dates to them. Uh -huh. And one of the first things we're going to want to figure out is what of those things do we want to continue for multiple years? So the ELO, we have this summer covered. We have this school year covered. And we have next summer covered, but we don't have the next school year covered for after school and intervention pieces. So we can, one of the first things we're going to make a decision about is which of the things in the ELO plans, which of the things in the LCP um, need to be extended. And we want to make sure we get those kinds of things taken care of for the continuity of uh, a program. So that will be part of the, of this planning process is uh, building and continuing the work you've already approved and done. And that's what they're asking us to do in the coordination of the plans. Very good. Yes. Uh, very important for outcomes by 2024, correct? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Timeline. Oh, I like that timeline up there. Page 16. Excellent report right there. The whole report was very good. Uh, priorities and themes. Uh, again, I'm going to stress that school health clinics, full comprehensive services. I didn't see anything like that in there. Nutritional issues. Uh, you know, I just read a report today. The nutritional, I mean, students are going hungry throughout the whole United States and California also. We feed the world, but yet we, can't, we cannot feed our kids. You know, uh, we need to do something that, can we use that for legislation, lobbying? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that. You can put me in jail, okay, Mr. Perez. Okay, really. <laughs> I saw that in the news too. Um, uh, libraries, I support librarianships after school, weekend Saturdays, you know, uh, before school. Uh, we have after school programs. I didn't see before school programs. A lot of parents go to work early in the morning. They don't have babysitters in the morning. They need to drop off their kids in school early. So maybe we need a before school program. So we have those. Oh yeah, but more. <laughs> uh, child. Well, we're going to do child care. Oh, that was very interesting. Ch children who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Now, we're now I know that Sac we have partnership with Sacramento County, right? Is that the, the group of students that you're talking about that we're going to work with? I don't believe we have any school age students that um, are incarcerated. Um, I know we have um, adults that are on probation oh, that right, we're right, teaching. Right. I'm getting mixed up with that. They're not incarcerated, but they have an alternate school on, and over here by the, by the, 
by the Co the county office of ed does offer right. offer a community um, school for mm -hmm. the students i believe you're referring to at the gerber road location yes by the yeah by the the bus stop, by the buses, by the by yeah, the facility. Yeah, at the Gerber Road location, they're actually right. building a brand new facility that they're right. moving into. Right, I see into. that. When's yeah. that opening? I believe it's open. Well, as soon as. So there's a fence around it still. Yeah, but they are they well, are they don't start as early as we do, so yeah. they're, they're going to open for this fall. Okay. Yes. So those are the individual students you're talking about. So they're still considered our students for those that attend. So that center has more than just Elk Grove students in it. Yeah, so okay, extended extended days. Also, I think I support and also extended year. <laughs> Those two other ones, extended day services and extended year. Keep them busy. <laughs> Keep them busy. That's it. Thank you very much. Excellent report. Thank you, Mr. Yang, followed by Ms. Chiris Espinoza. Thank you for your presentation. Um, with all the stakeholders' inputs, these bullet points looks looks like the ones that we need for our school district. I just wanted to touch on a couple of them, or maybe more. Um, so, equity. That's, are we adding more, more help? So the board took action to um, actually hire additional staff in the equity office. For purposes of this conversation, that would be whatever the board would like to bring forward and see. Okay. So it could be in the form of staff, it could be in the form of services to students. I mean, it, it's, I would defer to Matt Espinoza had he been here, but he has a plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I don't see transportation here, right? There's no transportation here. So this was feedback that we've heard over time from the board. So if transportation is an interest, we can add it. It is on the list from from the business services side of the house. It is, we've, we've added it to the list. This is just the things that we've heard from the board. We wanna make sure we captured, but transportation's right in line, so. Okay, perfect. Uh, virtual um, learning. Um, I think we hear some concerns about students and parents not comfortable um, in person learning. Um, so for the purpose of constituents listening to us right now, can you kind of go over what that virtual um, learning looks like for this coming up year? Yes. Yeah, so we lost the ability to do distance learning the way parents and students um, went through it for the 2021 school year. Going forward, the only options that the district has to offer would be independent study and then the virtual academy, which is an independent study program. The other option would be Elk Grove Charter School, which is also an independent study type program. It has some seat time, but for the most part, it's independent study. Um, the independent study itself, as far as education code is concerned, has been revised, so it has more teeth in it. Um, so it would probably feel more like what students and parents experienced previously as far as the ensuring that the um, engagement's happening with our students and that completion of work and that it's not just, you know, turning in paper packets, if you will. So those right now, that's the only option that we legally can offer. Um, and we are and just to that. just to build on that a bit um, as part of the budget trailer bill language there was adjustments that, that need to be made in the offerings that um, that school districts do it, it's still independent study, but there are some um, components that are uh, opportunities for students to directly engage with 
uh, with staff members and it's different by grade level. So we're actually, uh, Mr. Cerruti and the team, uh, Mr. Murray and uh, Dr. Graywall are working through the update of that, uh, that process right now so that we'll be fully ready uh, when our virtual academies open uh, for August and we'll likely be uh, bringing to the board an updated board policy because there's a board policy change that has to happen. So it'll be a, um, a quick turnaround. So you'd probably expect to see that um, August 10th, but that, that work is being done um, in accordance with the new regulations, which it's not going to be distance learning. The, the, those, you know, that uh, legislation has sunset, uh, but it will be um, more, more adult and more teacher um, embedded than has been our traditional um, independent study and virtual academy model. And so we'll have more details for families um, in short order. Okay, thank you. Well, I wanna circle back real quick on transportation so that I have a clear understand of it. I know that we are on it. And from what I was hearing earlier is that in comparison to in classes, um, in terms of numbers of students in the class, if they were mass, then we will not, we will have a regular capacity. That's what I heard, right? It's my understanding that we can do full capacity on a bus as long as the staff and the okay. students are mass. So, so on the bus will be the same thing? Yes. Okay, so that's our decision as of now. And we've already communicated that out to our okay. parents. Right, I just want to make it clear. I know that we got constituents listening to us. Just want to make it absolutely clear. We okay. just have to make sure we stay on the agendized items. So transportation as a funding priority, yeah. but um, we just have to be careful because it's because transportation, how we're doing transportation right now isn't agendized. So we just have to be careful. What okay, got it. Yep. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chair Espinoza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this uh, slide 18 still reflects my priorities. I think everything is encapsulated here. The only thing that um, I might suggest is maybe uh, an increase to the ASB budget augmentation that we did. You know, I understand that that was targeted at just getting us, getting the students off the ground at the beginning of the school year, but um, it's going to take them a little bit of time to fundraise. You know, maybe half the term, the full term really for anything meaningful. So I, I'd love us to go back and provide an additional augmentation there. That's all. All right. Um, my board members have excellent ideas. I agree. Um, I think, and I know the staff is aware of this. These are things students need right now is what we need to give to them. And this is a one-time opportunity to provide things they need for the long-term. Um, VAPA, books, classroom instruction, modernization, those things, they're all included here. So I appreciate you looking through all those lenses. Um, you have what you need, right, Mr. Hoffman? We are good, appreciate okay. it very much. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to move on to our action items of the night. Um, we have a resolution to eliminate classified positions. Ms. Soriano, are there any public comments related to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Good evening, Board President Albiani, members of the board. Thank you. Members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Avalos, staff and community. Um, the first item on the action item for tonight is the board is asked to adopt uh, the attached resolution to eliminate classified positions due to lack of work or lack of funds pursuant to Ed Code sections 45114, 45298, 45308, and 45117. The positions that are listed on the resolution, there are four, and they are all currently vacant. Thank you. I'd like to call for a motion to adopt resolution number three, authorizing the governing board to eliminate classified positions. So move, Madam Chair. Moved by Ms. Chair Espinoza, seconded by Mr. Perez. It requires a roll call vote. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Aye. Mr. Forchina? Aye. Myself is aye. Ms. 
Dr. Martinez Valier is out of the room. Can she add her vote later or do we just go with 6 0? Okay. Passes 6 0. I'll ask her to go on the record when she returns. Um, number two, amendments agreements for non represented employees. Ms. Soriano, are there any public comments related to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no public Question. comments related to this item. Thank you. Mr. Singh? So, the oral summary of amendment agreements for unrepresented employees, California Government Code Section 54953, Part C, Part Subpart 3, requires that a verbal summary of the proposed compensation and fringe benefits be given to the public prior to final board action on certain employment agreements. A, amendment agreements for the following positions. The term of such employment agreements shall each be extended by one year through and including June 30th, 2024, and effective July 1, 2021. They each shall move one step on their respective salary schedule unless they are on the top of unless they are on the top step of the salary schedule or on a two-year step. Number one, Deputy Superintendent at Business Services and Facilities. Number two, Deputy Superintendent Education Services and Schools. Number three, Associate Superintendent. Number four, Chief Financial Officer. Number five, Chief Technology Officer. Number six, Assistant Superintendent of Schools. Number seven, Assistant Superintendent of Schools. Number eight, Director of Communications and Public Information Officer. And number nine, Chief Human Resources Officer. Whereas all eligible represented employees in the district automatically receive eligible step and column advances effective July 1st, step advances, advances for unrepresented contracted employees must be approved by the board in open session at a regular school board meeting. Accordingly, the proposed fifth amendment employment agreements for the Deputy, Super, Deputy Superintendent Business Services and Facilities Associate Superintendent and Chief Financial Officer. The proposed Fourth Amendment Employment Agreement for the Deputy Superintendent Education Services and Schools and the proposed Third Amendment Employment Agreements for the Chief Technology Officer and both Assistant Superintendents of School positions. There are two of them. The proposed First Amendment Employment Agreement for the Director of Communications and Public Information Officer and Chief Human Resources Officer contain the following material terms. Number one, term. The term of the proposed amendment employment agreements for one, Deputy Superintendent Business Services and Facilities, Deputy Superintendent Education Services and Schools, three, Associate Superintendent, four, Chief Financial Officer, five, Chief Technology Officer, six, both Assistant Superintendent of Schools, and seven, Director of Communications and Public Information Officer, and eight, Chief Human Resources Officer, shall be extended by one year to June 30th, 2024. Number two, compensation. The following constitutes each employee's base salary effective June 1, 2021. The Deputy Superintendent of Business Services and Facilities is currently placed on steps eight and nine of the Deputy Superintendent salary schedule. Effective July 1, 2021, he shall continue for a second year on step eight and nine, which is $249,064. B, the Deputy Superintendent of Education Services and Schools is currently on steps six and seven of the Deputy Superintendent salary schedule. Effective July 1, 2021, he shall move on to the next step of the salary schedule and his base salary at steps eight and nine shall be $249,064. C, the Associate Superintendent is currently on steps eight and nine of the Associate Superintendent salary schedule. Effective July 1, 2021, he shall move to the next step on the salary schedule and his base salary at step 10 shall be $229,358. D, the Chief Financial Officer is currently placed on steps six and seven of the Chief Financial Officer salary schedule. Effective July 1, 2021, she shall move to the next uh, step on the salary schedule and her base salary at steps eight and nine shall be $173,262. E, the Chief Technology Officer is currently placed on steps six and seven of the Chief Technology Officer salary schedule effective July 1, 2021, he shall continue for a second year on steps six and seven. His base salary at step six and seven shall continue to be $169,865. F, both assistant superintendents of schools are currently placed on steps six and seven of the assistant superintendent salary schedule. 
effective July 1st, 2021, both assistant superintendents of schools shall continue for a second year on steps six and seven. Their base salaries at step six and seven shall continue to be $172,081. G, the Director of Communications and Public Information Officer is currently placed on steps eight and nine of the Director of Communications and Public Information Officer salary schedule, effective July 1st, 2021. She shall move to the she, she shall move to the next uh, step on the salary schedule and her base salary at step 10 shall be $129,703. H, the Chief Human Resource Officer is currently placed on steps eight and nine of the Chief Human Resources Officer salary schedule, effective July 1, 2021. He shall move on to the next step on the salary schedule and his base salary at step 10 shall be $160,666. Number three, the one deputy superintendent, business services and facilities, two deputy superintendent, education services and schools, three associate superintendent, human resources, and four, the chief financial officer, five, the chief technology officer, and six, both assistant superintendents of school, seven, director of communications and public information officer, and eight, chief human resources officer, will continue to receive the same health and welfare benefits and retiree benefits as other district certificated employees as those benefits may change from time to time. Number four, the, this concludes the summary of the fifth amendment to the employment agreements for one, the deputy superintendent, business services and facilities, two, associate superintendent, and three, chief financial officer, and the fourth amendment employment agreement for one, the deputy superintendent, education services and schools, and the third amendment employment agreements for one, Chief Technology Officer to both Assistant Superintendents of Schools and the First Amendment Employment Agreements for, for the uh, Director of Com Communications and Public Information Officer and to the Chief Human Resources Officer. This concludes the summary of the proposed amendment agreements and these amendment agreements are available from the District Office upon request. Thank you. I'd like to call for a motion to approve the non-represented employment agreements and amendments to non-represented employment agreements. Good discussion. You have a comment? Oh, okay. Does anybody have discussion? No. Um, so I will move. May I have a second? Second. Seconded by Dr. Martina Salir. Roll call vote. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Mr. Perez. I have a question. Um, financial impact. If an individual go promotes to the next level, wouldn't that be an a, a, a impact on, on the budget? Okay. I'm going to ask my friend. And then it has to answer that question. So, Mr. Perez, when we do projections for salaries and benefits for all employees, including cabinet members, we uh -huh. do include a step change. Uh -huh. So it's in our multi-year projections already. So that's why the financial summary is not completed for that item. <laughs> but no, the fact, I'll just, just throwing this out. I, because I didn't like uh, the there was no uh, financial impact when reality, I think there is because of the fact that the employee is going to jump up another salary level and that impacts our, 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 our budget. You're, that's all. That's all I want to say. Yep. Okay. You're, you're, you're accurate. You're what? accurate. You're accurate. We just build, we just, we just know this ahead of time. So, right. Right. Yeah, but you're, and you you're plan right. for that. Yeah. And, and the other suggestion I like to say is that, um, is it, was this the executive role, executive body? All I don't, these. I don't understand the question. One more time. Executive role. When you when you refer to our uh, your um, you use the term executive role. Is this your executive role? This is our cabinet. Cabinet. Okay, cabinet. cabinet. Yeah. yeah. This is all cabinet. Yeah. And um, I requested. Do you have you had uh, time to do? Um, uh, an organization chart. We have an organization chart. We can do. We can okay. send you. Yeah, yeah, maybe with an update because I think there's been a lot of changes since. 
Is that last year? So that's not that. I can get you the most updated one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Yang. Um, before I vote, I want to ask a question. This is new to me. Just is that okay? Of course, that's okay. Okay. Well, we just so, in the future, just as I reminded Mr. Fortuna, if we can talk about it before, and then just votes or votes, not okay. like discussions. Yeah. And because this is my first time going through no problem this, at just, all, Mr. Okay. Yang. Okay. Please feel free. Sure. So the salaries, um, the boards have any involvement in terms of changing it uh, with there are step and call i probably shouldn't be the person answering this so the way the way the contracts are set up there's the the contracts are in place and there's a set salary schedule that goes along with each position just like um you know teachers have a salary schedule um, psychologists have a salary so each of the cabinet members has a salary schedule built into their contract and so uh, what this is is the moving from one step to the next you see some of them where it's six seven and what that means is um, an employee in that position is on that step for two years, their sixth year and their seventh year. And then in the eighth year, they would move to step eight, nine. They would be on that step for two years before they go to step 10. But that the agreement on what those, um, what those amounts are, um, that, that's already agreed to um, in the original contracts that the, um, the board approved. So the board doesn't approve these salaries? I'm just curious. So, we we do negotiations, uh -huh. and then when people are hired, there, there are salaries set in the. So we do we make any adjustment in, like in the future, or do if it's set, then we just leave it alone? Well, adjustments adjustments generally get made within the contract, um, in line with what other units um, get. So that, so that's how those. Uh, the contracts are adjusted um, based on what the EG teams, the, which is the meet and confer group uh, that we have, the managers, uh, that's generally how those adjustments are made. Okay. So how long is the, the contract usually? Three years. That's okay. What, that's, so you're extending. One of the things that the board is um, being asked to do is to extend the contract by a year so that um, the, the contracts go for three years. Okay, thank you. That's all I got. Your vote, sir. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Sheriff Espinoza? Aye. Mr. Forchina? Aye. Thank you. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. I myself, it's unanimous. Thank you. Our next, uh, our next item is the fifth amendment agreement for superintendent, a non-represented employee. Ms. Soriano, is there any public comment related to this item? Madam Board President, I'll be on There are no public comments related to this item. Thank you, Mr. Singh. I promise this one is shorter. This item is the board's discussion and possible approval of the fifth amendment to the superintendent's employment agreement. SB 1436 requires pursuant to California government code section 54953C subsection three that a verbal summary of the proposed compensation and fringe benefits be given to the public prior to final board action on an employment agreement. Whereas all eligible represented employees in the district automatically receive step and column advances effective July 1st, the term of employment and the step advances for unrepresented contracted employees must be approved by the board in open session at a regular school board meeting. Accordingly, the proposed fifth amendment to the superintendent's employment agreement contains the following material terms. The term of the superintendent's agreement shall be extended by one year to June 30, 2025, Effective July 1st, 2021, the superintendent shall move to steps eight and nine of the superintendent's salary schedule, and his annual base salary shall be 370598 Number three, the superintendent will continue to receive the same health and welfare benefits and retiree benefits as other district certificated employees consistent with this employment agreement. This concludes the summary of the Fifth Amendment to the superintendent's employment agreement. A complete copy of the Fifth Amendment 
is available from the district office upon request. Thank you. Anybody want to say anything before we take a vote? Mr. Fortina. I have a question for Karen. Um, we're, we're dealing with, with uh, this issue and the one previously because it's required by law, correct? And does the law indicate that our only responsibility is to address the base salary as, as opposed to total compensation of each of the positions? So in the past, the school board has taken action in open session to approve the underlying agreements that these amendment agreements relate to. So for total compensation, the salary schedule, health benefit, all the working conditions, those were addressed when you initially um, employed these individuals in their current capacities. And typically the board adopts an amendment agreement, which it's required to under the Brown Act in a public board meeting open session. So all the prior agreements that have come before the board has acted upon and the original agreement contains um, everything that was originally negotiated, including salary schedules and, and the movement process through the salary schedules. And each time an amendment is adopted, that amendment modifies whatever the original contract was. It modifies everything, but we only discuss the base salary, correct? Um, what's required by law is a it's relatively recent law, I think it was 2013 that was passed where you have to in open session have that discussion. Um, but if you were to modify some other portion of the agreement that was also could also be part of an amendment agreement. So if there was something else that impacted the term or compensation or health benefits, for example, other than what we're discussing. What was the purpose of, of the requirement that we do this in open session? Uh, the, the underlying reason for the legislation that required an open se session action item on these topics and a discussion, um, there's a city of Bell um, matter that occurred where public officials were um, in receiving very, very large um, benefits and salaries. Public was unaware. And as a result of that um, situation, the state legislature adopted additional requirements under the Brown Act for approving local agency executive agreements. But if you only address base salary, you don't get at potential under the table issues. There shouldn't be any under the table issues. <laughs> If there are other issues related to compensation or benefits that should come before the board in open session for local agency executives, but also for represented employees, when you review the AB 1200 review, when you approve action to approve salary schedules and tentative agreements with their bargaining units, all those groups, every employee group comes before the board. Are we free, are, are we free to, to request total compensation be discussed in public as opposed to just base salary? Certainly you can, the public is entitled to see all the agreements, which includes everything, including health and welfare benefits. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we'll go for a vote, Court. Mr. Perez. Oh, uh, I have some Hold questions. On. Excuse me. I have some questions. You didn't, ask, you didn't ask any fellow board members if they have any questions. Well, actually, I did. Who? And, well, Mr. Fortini was just speaking as one. I didn't realize you had one. Um, please go ahead. Um, I, the process of this particular item, could it have, this is a legal question, um, could this have been discussed beforehand in closed session? Mm -hmm. And then this process that we have here. So what the law requires is that no action to approve 
um, an employment contract with the local agency executive occurs in closed session. It has to occur at a regular school board meeting in open session. However, if you're negotiating with an unrepresented employee, just as when you are negotiating with represented bargaining units, you are allowed in closed session. In the case of unrepresented executives, you need to do that at a regular board meeting, closed session. You can discuss parameters for purposes of negotiating with those local agency executives in closed session, but no action may be taken on final approval of an agreement. Right. Uh, so that's the issue I have in this process. Uh, and you mentioned that you, you, we could have discussed this issue in, in, in closed session. It's not but, but not I make an, a decision. You may not make a decision in closed session right. regarding a local agency executive uh, term, of contract, or compensation. You can, under the uh, agreements that you're reviewing tonight, you are following through and extending those agreements one year and implementing the existing salary schedule without changing the existing salary schedule. You may at subsequent board meetings after represented employees and easy team um, negotiations and meet and confer conclude, maybe reviewing those salary schedules and considering other actions. But at this point, you're just uh, following through with your prior agreements by, agreements by extending them. So, um, but you can you can have closed session at regular board meeting. Yeah, you've got the parameters, but not take half. Uh, yeah, that's session. my experience. That that's what happens, but yet it didn't happen. We've never that, done that with this. What? We've never the the negotiation for my original contract. You guys did that in closed session. I'm assuming because I got a original phone. one. Yes. Yeah, I had a phone call, but the uh -huh. the annual um, amendment. Um, this is my seventh year here. We've never done that in closed session. Yeah, but we could have. I mean, this, the, the whole idea is to do it in public so people yeah, know. Yeah, exactly, but yet we didn't. And so that's, you know, we had a process, but yet we didn't continue that process. And prior, prior uh, uh, superintendents, we had that process well, in, in place. In, well, in the past, you could do it in closed so that's what happened and people didn't and then the public didn't know about it so what what's changed is this now needs to happen in public before it all happened in private and that's how no, no, like no. the city of bell got out of control because they, they right. didn't have to report it um out in public they just made decisions behind the scenes so that, that's why that's what this is trying to get at right but yet I, I'm, I'm disappointed in, in this process what happened this way because I think we, because there was, I, I guess, I could probably, I'm not sure if I could say this. We were going to have some issues or talks with you regarding in closed sessions, but they, we never ha had time. Uh, we were correct. talking about- We want to make sure that we stay on this particular agenda item and not delve into items that would yeah. be subject to closed yeah. sessions. Mr. Yeah, we'll, I will speak to something that was on the agenda and that's, and that's the, the board um, evaluation and the superintendent evaluation. And, and I think we, we can all agree um, that we need to do a better job with both of those processes. And that's, that's why we're putting the new, the new processes in place so that those will be built in. Uh, we're gonna have um, Mike Merchant um, facilitate those processes. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that they get done and we'll schedule the time for the board um, opportunity and for uh, my time in that. And the evaluation itself um, will be a closed session conversation. My, my evaluation, the board will report out on the findings of it, but, but the actual action of the... Yeah. Well, anyway, may I like to make the motion that we uh, postpone this and that go back to closed session and, and, and have a man-to-man -man talk about this, this, this issue a woman or a board talk with you uh, uh, and, and come back next board meeting and, and, and vote on this issue. That's what I suggest. Okay. Nobody wants to second that? I'll, I'll second it for discussion. Yeah. Okay, you've made your point. Did anybody else want to comment? 
Um, I'll comment. Uh, this is a regularly thing, thing we've done for seven years. This is the way it was taken. It used to be done closed doors. That was not appropriate. It has been brought into the open. It is now done in the open in a meeting like this. There are times to have these discussions. Um, in the years I've been here, we have not been consistent on having discussions with our superintendent and setting clear goals. And that has been one of my goals as a president. And we do have that scheduled this year, actually within the next six weeks. So I think this, um, I, I apologize. I, I feel this is offensive to Mr. Mr. Hoffman and I feel it's out of line. Um, does anybody else wanna say anything else? And um, we can vote. Yep, Mr. Porcina. Yeah, um, sorry if you if you believe it's offensive. It, it's, it's there were questions. First of all, um, I, I have to say that with respect to process, it, 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 to me, it, it doesn't make any difference if we've done something the same way for fifty years. That that doesn't mean because you've done it for fifty years, you you can't change it. We can change anything anytime we believe there's a reason to change it. So, so to the extent that we've done something a certain way, does it mean that forevermore we're locked into doing it that way? That's, that's kind of crazy uh, to think that way. Um, what I was getting at was A couple of purposes of the act was so that the public had complete knowledge with respect to an individual's compensation, correct? That's correct. That's why in right. 2016, Mr. Pertina, the entire contract, any contract term, um, regarding Mr. Hoffman's total compensation was read aloud at a public board meeting before this board took action on it in 2015. So there is no aspect of any of the cabinet or superintendent's agreements that have not been orally described in open session and the board has been provided an opportunity to consider in this book. That doesn't preclude that you can continue to do that, correct? I'm not sure I understand that. It is allowable to talk about each of the components of the agreement on an annual basis. There's no mandate to do so under the law, but the board could approach it that way. Thank you. Ms. Chair Espinoza. Uh, just a quick note to all my colleagues. Um, any of us can misspeak, and we're doing our thinking and communicating live in person here, but I just want to caution us all to be very careful with our word choice. Our words matter, and they convey a lot. So if we say something like under the table, um, maybe some information is not highlighted or called out in the manner in which we might want it to be, but under the table is illegal. And if anyone, anyone that's employed by the district is receiving under the table compensation, that's a very serious matter. So I just, I want us to be specific with our language um, because, you know, I, I actually haven't grasped like what is the problem that we're trying to solve here. So I just, I want us to be clear about what we're talking about. Um, I, I don't know that anybody said there was a problem. There was- Then I don't know what this whole discussion was for. Well- it, Why we didn't just vote it up or down. It was, I, I've, I only speak for myself with respect to the question of, are we, uh, meeting both the letter and the spirit of the law with respect to the total compensation. When, when we look at employee raises, we're always talking total compensation, total compensation. 
Well, we know what, what that means for bargaining unit people. Yeah. Does the public have a right to know what that means for contracted people? It, it, real, it's a simple question. Got it. Okay. That's the motion we have. Oh. The motion we have first and a second on is to postpone this item. Are we still discussing? Did you ask any other members if, if they wanted to add any, want to discuss this before? I, you I, have a, I have a point of a clarification. Okay. So, uh, Beth, you mentioned that we were discuss in six weeks in regard to the, evaluation. Uh, the cabinet's Salary? I, Did you mention no, we're that? We're not talking about cabinet salary. Um, I, I, you say about six weeks. I just, I just, I did wasn't sure what that you were referring to. Remember, um, and then having the superintendent evaluation feedback. I was oh, okay. speaking to the, the talk that we've never talked about the superintendents. Okay, so and I, I was trying to answer what Mr. So Perez Tony, was I, I wasn't to. really sure of what you, you want to postpone to discuss this and to discuss what. Um, I'm not really clear. Well, there was an item in closed session that was brought to our attention uh, regarding uh, could be very important to the outcome or his performance that he uh, brought up to us that we need to be uh, very uh, oh, what's the word astute to that the outcome should be very good. What outcome? Well, can I talk about that? You currently um, are not in closed session, and so you're not talking about anything other than um, whether or not to approve the addendum agreement for the superintendent. Well, I guess I'm just going to say it. Um, in 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 the closed session, he said we need to have. Well, if it's no, closed, no, 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 no. if it's closed session, you if, should not be. Please sharing. do not say it. Well, what? what the, you would like to defer this? Huh? Your motion was well, to defer on. this. She's the one, the legal. She's a legal person, I, not I, you. I take my direction from the board, and the way I do that is through the board president. So, Madam President, and is that the motion we have on the table is to defer this. He has a reason for it, but is based in closed session and no, closed session items, items can't be discussed here. Okay. So I, we cannot hear that. If you had a different thing you'd like to refer okay. to, please go ahead. Okay, the other two, okay. So I won't say um, there's, okay. It's been, it was bring, brought to my attention that we need to produce outcomes in 2024 because they are going to have uh, legislation more to fund public schools. So as a result of that information that I received uh, in the community, I feel that th that'd be very important in, in his co this contract, such language states that it's by 2024, students of Elk Grove Unified School District's outcomes will be greater or have been improved since 2021. Mr. Perez, a language I, like that. Mr. Perez, maybe I can help. Yes. That, that would make sense in putting in the evaluation tool that we developed. The, the, that's the idea is, is you, want, you want X, Y, and Z goals hit by X date. That's, that's, why, we're, that's why we're doing the board tool where mm -hmm. the board's going to identify the goals mm -hmm. that they want staff working on mm -hmm. and then those goals will drive what's included in my evaluation mm -hmm. and then that's in that and then you'll be able to but that so that's the, that's separate than the contract you know the goals don't go in the contract oh well, those the are outcomes of which I, I think this board should have on paper that you know, the the Elko Unified School student body have improved and and, and a variety of uh, I agree. issues. That's, but that's the evaluation process. Uh -huh. That's not the contract. Well, uh, so, but the, but the but the contract could be based on the evaluation process moving forward. Yeah, exactly. That, that could be better aligned than it currently is. I agree. Yes. So that's that's where I'm coming from. That's it. You know, it's nothing. It's uh, what's the word you use? <laughs> I don't. 
It was just mm -hmm. well, I, being sincere. Can I continue my comment? Oh, yes, go ahead. I, I just not sure why we should be postponing this when we are not making any changes, right? We might. I mean, are we? Do we have the right to make changes? Yes. And is it is it the time to make the changes? Yes. Because those are in, important information. I, I do not believe so. If you're asking my opinion, I think well, I've stated that clearly. Because, Mr. Prez did you disagrees give input? with me. Let me ask you this, Mr. Yang. Did you give input on those uh, the, Tony, on you're that shout, you're shouting contract again. amendment? Tony, you're shouting again. Well, I haven't. And I, that's why I was asking a question earlier, just so that I understand I the Would process. Like As a board, I I would love to. It, it doesn't mean that I'm going to change it, but that I would love to know the process and understand my rights as a board. Madam Chair. But, I mean, if we don't know what we are postponing for, there's no reason to. And that's why I was trying to ask you, because you make the motion. I'm like, why are we postponing this item and we didn't postpone the previous item? It just didn't make sense to me. We, we could have had an open discussion in closed session with legal right there, the do's and don'ts, how we could have wrote this, this and what we could have added. You could have did that. And if members had questions about process, Any they could have asked before the meeting. What? If members had questions about the process that we engage in every single year with respect, I understand the new members are in a different place. We could have asked that before the meeting as opposed to trying to figure that out now. Um, so for the, so hurry? for the edification of those who haven't done this every single year, um, yes, the, the contract extensions and the evaluation of the superintendent are on an annual cycle. The fact that they are no longer aligned is really our fault as a board. We have, you know, as Madam Chair said, we have let it fall behind, so they're no longer aligned. I personally don't feel um, it's fair to penalize any employee um, because we let those things get out of sync. Um, the evaluation and contracts can be amended every single year. The evaluation is amended every single year to reflect new information that we get, new programs that come up, new goals. That is absolutely something that we engage in as a board. I, I understand that not everybody here has had a chance to see that process play out, but I did want you to know that you will very soon. And that's the next six weeks? That's yes, and we are redesigning the process okay. to make improvements on it. Yeah, yes. so if we gonna have a chance to chime in in six weeks, I think there's no need to postpone this discussion, in my opinion. It, it's the information and the, the timeline that was presented during discussion item number one, board self-assessment and superintendent evaluation feedback. I'm not sure it's six weeks, it might be even lesser. Yeah, so would you like to redraw your motion? I think, no, I'm gonna stick with the, the process. It seems what you would do, most like when you do a salary increase or a, a renewable contract, you usually do evaluation, right? Yeah, but we're not okay. there yet, right? I just heard that that's going to be done in six weeks. Yeah, but do you, when, when have you, in public life, got a, 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 a raise before you got your raise, your, your raise? I know I don't know any business that would give you a raise and, and a week later give you a, a, a valuation. You usually go get your valuation first and talk your strengths and weaknesses and your outcomes and, and your, 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 uh, your career development mm. training, IDP, individual development plan. And then if you meet those goals, then that's when you get your salary increase or your contract renewal with specific language. For your me, can I, call for the motion? can I make a comment? I, I'd like to call. I'd like to call for a motion to extend this meeting till 1030. I make a motion. Seconded. Aye. Second. Second. Mr. Yang. Aye. 
Mr. Forchina? Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Aye. Dr. Martinez Alir? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Mr. Aye. Perez? And now, can myself. I call for the motion? I'm sorry. Can, I, can we vote? Call the question. Sure. Um, on Ms. We are voting now on Mr. Perez's motion, seconded by Mr. Forchina, to postpone this. Mr. Perez? Yes, aye. Mr. Yang? No. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? No. Mr. Forchina? No. Ms. Jamerson? No. Ms. Dr. Martinez Alir? No. And no, myself, it fails 6 1. We are now back to our original. I would like to call for a motion to approve the Fifth Amendment to the Superintendent's Employment Agreement. So move. Make a motion to move. I'll second. Moved by Dr. Martinez Alir, seconded by Nancy Cheris Espinoza. Sorry, I don't even know where that came from. Um, Mr. Perez. Uh, I'm going to call no because I think the process was. It's a yes no vote, we heard. Mr. Yang. I, I kind of lost it there. What, okay, what? so we, we've decided not to postpone it, and then there was a motion, so now we are voting on it. It's a and motion Mr. to move forward. To move forward. Yes. Right? Move forward yeah, so, and approve it. Aye. Just like we did on the previous. Yes. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Mr. Forchina. Aye. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Dr. Martinez Alir. Aye. And myself, yes, that passes 6 1. Thank you. Board member and superintendent reports. Does anybody have a report about business to the district? Uh, I see Mr. Superintendent smoking to his mic. We'll start with him. Uh, so I just want to say um, thank you to, uh, to my team. Uh, thank you to the board for recognizing them um, tonight for the incredible work that they um, have done to this point um, and will do moving forward. Um, I also want to say thank you to the board and the entire Elk Grove Unified um, community for opening schools. Um, it was an absolute um, amazing um, day. It literally brought me to tears uh, to see the, uh, the emotion of the students, the staff, and the parents, um, and the incredible amount of work um, that's been done uh, by the team uh, to make that happen. Um, and with the leadership of the board, um, greatly appreciate of that. And thank you for um, the contract extensions for my cabinet, they are um, deserving and the, uh, the best team in the state of California, I have no doubt. And um, painful as it was, I also uh, thank you for, uh, for the extension of my term um, and the step as, as well. So thank you. All right, was there anybody who met on a board committee? Who needs to report, thank you. Then we have other items from the floor. Mr. Forchina. Thank you. Uh, just one thing. Um, we, we had uh, one public comment in particular tonight with three respect to uh, students wearing masks and enforcement. Are we going to put something out to uh, our staff and our parents with respect to how we're going to enforce Force the masking policy if we are going to enforce the masking policy because there's lots of questions and the e easiest way to deal with the issue is to put out a communication. Okay. Okay. So we so uh, we will post an updated uh, version of our safety guidance. Um, right now, the uh, the direction from the state and the direction from um, county health is is masks. The, the 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 huge advantage of masks is masks allow us to have less distance. If we go no masks, if that if that if that were the direction, then the other direction is going to come be is going to come with that is you're going to need to spread people apart. As soon as we have distance, then having our schools fully open becomes a huge challenge. So the masks allow us to reduce distance because that, that is the, uh, and the other factors that we have in place, the cleaning and all the other work, but we will have that, uh, the updated version based on the CDC, CDPH um, and County Health will have the updated version um, 
on Friday um, as required. Our current plan checks all the boxes, but yeah, in, including enforcement. I'll have to, I have to, I have to walk, work through with the team on that with regards to the term enforcement. Um, so I'll have to work through with that. I, yeah, I mean, I would, and, and it's just by way of example, I would hope that 50% of the kids said we're not going to wear a mask. We're not going to be sending 50% of the kids home, or maybe we are. Your question's been asked. Anybody else? Well, I think that's a good point. Um, so what is our... Um, they will work on what the policy will be. Yeah, so the, the policy is not law, right? As, a, as the lady alluded to, right? So it's, it's so, a requirement. It's not, it's not, it's not a, the, the masking is, is a state level requirement. What the, what districts do with regards to providing other educational opportunities, mm -hmm. if for, for uh, children that choose, uh, families that choose to not have their kids wear masks, the districts need to have a alternative option for them. But the masking, the masking is required by the state. Um, it's not, it's not a, it's not a recommendation. What's coming from the county right now is a strong recommendation for everybody in public um, to be masked. That's a, that's a recommendation, yeah. but it is, kids are required to be masked. Um, that is, that, that is a requirement. That's not a um, recommendation. And, and I support that. I, you know, I want to piggyback on Mr. Fischina, just, just, in case there's parents or kids who do not want to wear masks, what what are we going to do with that? So that we kind of foreseeing and prepare for possible issue in the very near future. Yeah, we're working with families currently, okay. um, and families to this point have uh, worked with us because they understand the um, the the requirements and we do have the options um, through the virtual academy um, for families that are uncomfortable masking um, that that is that is the option currently what's gonna you know if that's that's where that's where we are that's where we are currently okay so, uh, i got one more thing since i'm on the mic is that okay Beth? yeah okay um i want you to touch on the African-American vendors that came and proposed to us. What is the latest on that? I want you to speak so that the public could hear uh, the status of that, if you don't mind. Yes, it's not agendized so to, be, to be able to, you can, you can bring up a topic that you want us to, uh, to talk about, but, but I can't, it's not an agendized item. What I'll say is we've been in contact with those three vendors and they understand where we are in the process. Okay. Is that Thank a motion? You. No, it's not a motion. I just ask him a question. Just oh. you want because to make I know motion? that I know that we just heard uh, some constituents call in and um, uh, making a statement of wanting to know more of it, and I just wanted to know more as well. And I think it's it's important for the public to hear it. Uh, it you know, we all about transparency. But if you can't talk about it, I understand. I just want to uh, you to talk about what you can't talk about. Does that make sense? Yep. I'd like to make the motion we agendize that issue. You, you want to second it? It's up to you. See, no seconds. I'm going to move on. Are you finished, Mr. Yang? Well, I just want to give uh, uh, so we We provided the board with an update of the process on Friday. Through the board communication we followed up with each of the three organizations on friday so that they understand where we where, where we are in the process okay so we're moving forward we are okay that's all i have thank you okay i have something um, press. this delta virus is worrying me very much i'm losing sleep it's like mr hoffman over here <laughs> we worry too much but we were the first district in the whole California to shut down 
And now we have this other, we have, that was the Corona virus. Now we have this Delta virus, which is much dangerous, more contagious, and more dangerous to our the students' age level. So I want to know, is this board going to take a stand or make a recommendation to the superintendent? Well, what level of, uh, of uh, community spread will we lock down or quarantine or what other actions may be when this, because at, at the rate this is going, it's almost doubling or 10% doubling every week. The direction from the board at this yes. point is to work very closely with public health and allow public health to lead. And that's, that's, and that, that's what we've been working on. We've said from the very start, that we would follow yes. the guidance. So that's right. the way, so that's that's what we will continue. Yes, you you, we, uh, you said that, but yet when we first uh, locked down, shut down our school, we didn't have no input. And uh, and, and we, we took proaction, we, preventive we things to, to prevent community spread. And I'm worried that that if we do not set these parameters and we're going to wait till how many people die, how many people get sick and, 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 and yet we're not taking a proactive preventive approach to this situation more so than the county. Because I know for a fact that within my community over there in region one and three are high incidence. They say this. The zip codes again, that you know people are getting sick. Then I look at the what do you call it, the county data sets. It's not only and it's spreading to Laguna, Franklin, Elk Grove. You look at the data sets, and and do you know if the, if it's COVID? Do you do you know uh, do you know if it's Corona or do you know if it's Delta? Are we going to take a proaction thing? That's a question that you board members need to think up here in your head. How many students and how many community members are going to get sick and you're going to wait for the county and it's doubling in your communities, in your school, in your districts. So that's all I got to say. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Chair Espinoza. I go back to my earlier comment about words matter and what we say as a board member in particular can carry a lot of weight and it can generate a lot of fear. So I don't want anyone to walk away from this conversation thinking we have like mass outbreaks in any regions or particular schools. So if your child has been in close proximity to someone who is COVID positive, you're gonna get a call from a school nurse. If your child has been in a classroom with someone, even if they weren't close, who uh, was COVID positive, you're going to get a letter. So if you haven't had that, um, there's definitely not anything to worry about. Thank you. Well, I, if I, in your area, in Franklin, it, it's one of the highest. Laguna is one of the highest. In, in our school district, the incidence of this issue is in your area, but yet you're not worried about it. You're that, that, about that is absolutely inappropriate. Look at the door dashboard. I, I, I look at the dashboard. I was looking at the dashboard. Can I chime in? I think I think we all worry about to a certain extent. Yes. But but you know, let's not jump to conclusion. Not I jump think, to conclusion. I think that uh, Nancy has a really good point. Uh, we gotta really be careful of choice of words. We we are we are worried to a certain extent, but let's not jump to conclusion. Okay. and put fear in people's mind mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people out there that values our words heavily. So I think at this point, we are progressing to go back to normal, some sort of normalcy, and let's, let's keep that positive vibe going. We are having students going in full five days. So let's focus on that, and we're going to do what we can to make sure student staff are safe. So let's, I think we should just keep at that for now. So again, so how many students are going Mr. to have to Press, come? Mr. Press, you've said it. In contact 
with Colvin. It's, you've said, it. thank you. Um, I have one last comment. Um, yes, I do harp on process. I think process is a foundation. The process I apply to is CSBA trained. It is best practices. And I believe changing things during a board meeting with no prior discussion or staff discussion is, as I was referred to tonight, crazy, which I don't appreciate. I'm adjourning this meeting as of 1022.